Son, do you want to know what the truth is? After this, there's no turning back. You take the blue pill and you wake up in your bed and believe whatever you want to. You take the red pill and you stay in Wonderland. And I show you just how deep the rabbit hole goes. Remember, all I'm offering is the truth. Nothing more. Welcome, everybody, to the Avengers chat. Uh, I want to say, first off, the intro where I'm swallowing the red pill is literally strictly taken from the idea of Plato's cave, which is a matrix concept, has zero to do with literally the way, I guess, red pill connotations are in, in politics and all that. Nothing to do with that. Purely just waking up and realizing maybe I've been wrong. I've been yeah, I feel like that whole. I feel like that whole opening is playing off of something but i can't place it i don't know <laughs> some is it a movie <laughs> some intertextuality there somewhere <laughs> it's not genetic i can it's, promise it's, my finger it's, on it play, it's plato josh yeah that's what i i mean i was going that way obviously but, yeah. right right i i just had to address that well obviously we have an all-star team here and i feel like i need to introduce some people so I'm going to be switching Dr. Kill and Dr. Bird. I'm putting you next here, uh, this way here. Dr. Jennifer Bird, I really appreciate you joining us today. Uh, thank you so much. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for, you know, including me in the whole thing. So it's been, it's a, it's, it's a thrill for me, really. <laughs> absolutely. And then David on the far end over here on the top, David McDonald, he has a YouTube channel. I might as well plug all of it at the same time here so we don't go slow. Uh, David's trying to hit a thousand subs. So what can we do today to achieve the goal of getting him closer to a thousand subscribers? That is the, the stream today. We're trying to bring everybody in to help him get subscribers because everyone on this panel, and we're also missing one right now, Dr. McClellan, are going to be addressing slavery. I believe it's slavery, correct? Help me out, David. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's a, it's, it's, not only is it just a panel on slavery, it is it will be the go-to resource for any conversation, the go-to panel for any conversation around slavery uh, and slavery apologetics in the Old Testament and the New Testament. Uh, we're going to do an absolute deep dive and be addressing the claims of many of your favorite apologists um, in uh, this discussion. Um, we're putting in like a lot of work. Uh, we're going to have much a lot of resources and everything's going to be cited. It's going to be... It's going to be brutal, will I say, um, for uh, those who pretend that slavery was a-okay. Um, it's going to be very not like that. Well, I linked it in the uh, chat, and I'm hoping people will go, first of all, go over there, drop a comment, leave what a, you said a wizard emoji or something? Yeah. So I thought it'd be really cool. So if anyone comes over um, on the live streams and the podcast and you comment and you leave a wizard emoji, because Derek is a wizard. <laughs> and also wizards are mythological uh if you leave a wizard emoji i will know th that you guys are from myth vision and then i'll be able to comment uh, appropriately to your comments to make sure i give them special attention because uh, it's super super appreciate for anyone who comes over and subscribes because when we do get to a thousand subscribers i get the ability to do super chats and if we get a large audience which i'm expecting um it'll be uh, really beneficial because uh to be able to know uh what comments to pay attention to uh and be able to actually find 
uh, relevant, relevant questions. So, yeah. Thank you. Uh, so this, all of these channels, we want you to subscribe to. Uh, this one is Dr. Birds, which we already introduced you to. And um, we're hoping to grow her channel as as well. Every academic we bring on, our hope is to try and get them more attention. But Dr. Dr. Bird, you're a public figure out here in the internet world, bringing the scholarship and as an, a female academic, we really value you. So uh, a couple words about your channel and uh, how people can help you out. Well, thanks. Um, I, you know, the channel, I'm just right now, I'm primarily creating short videos of, does the Bible really tell you what you think it does? Um, recently, I've shifted over to doing, you know, five to seven minute videos about um, how to read some of the stories attributed to Jesus differently and through more of an economic and political lens. And so that's kind of, that's kind of where my YouTube channel is. It's kind of <laughs> basic, really, at this point. Um, but, you know, I've also um, have a website that my personal website, which kind of connects you to all the various things I have going on. So I have a podcast called Wild Olive, which I'm really, um, yeah, jennifergracebird.com. Oh, great. My full name. Yeah. Jennifergracebird.com. Thank you. And yeah. yeah, I'm really pleased we have the first three episodes of Wild Olive, our um, game changing conversation about literature, culture, and the Bible. Um, it's a podcast I teamed up on. So, so if you go to my website, you can like get to all the different things I'm doing that way. It's kind of, yeah, yeah, everything's right here. Interviews, books, <laughs> podcast, bio, you do a lot of stuff and we love you for that. And we thank yep. you so much, Jennifer, for Thanks. being here and putting yourself out there publicly. I mean, it's, hmm. it's, uh, you know, it's a tough world and, uh, you are addressing tough topics. So, no, we love you here at Myth Vision. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, yeah. Derek. Yeah. Well, uh, Kip, Dr. Kill, uh, let me get you here in the front row seat. Tell us a little bit about yours and why people should go subscribe. Uh, you're muted. Damn. By the way, I just, I just subscribed, uh, to deep drinks podcast. Oh, I hadn't gone you. around to doing it yet. So, <laughs> so we actually just Woo. reached six, six, six subscribers. So. Really? Oh, take a picture, man. Take a picture <laughs> now. You have to do it. <laughs> I, I still have mine somewhere. Um, so, oh, yeah, possible. I'm uh, I'm Kip Davis. I'm a specialist in uh, early Judaism and the Dead Sea Scrolls, and I'm a biblical scholar. Uh, I make content on YouTube. I'm presently uh, doing a deep dive into the... Uh, the history and the contents of the Dead Sea Scrolls. It's titled The Dead Sea Scrolls Unapologetically. Um, and I am in the process of finishing the third video in that. Um, I also have a course upcoming through MVP courses called Ancient Israelite Religions, mm -hmm. Facts on the Ground and Propaganda in the Bible. And um, I've got a couple of other projects that I uh, I hope to be uh, bringing forward in the future. Uh, one of one of which I'm so uh, I, some of some of my work people are probably most familiar with me outside of uh, YouTube as a result of my um, my work with uh, uh, forgeries of Dead Sea Scrolls fragments in private collections um, with some of the some of the kerfuffle <laughs> of the last uh, of the last month. Uh, there's there's been some of this uh, this stuff has sort of uh, come up again. There's there's lawsuits that are ongoing, but um, but I actually have a uh, like a a 220 page um, analysis of uh, of the fragments and um, am in the process of getting that ready to uh, to fire off to publishers. I I written it up uh, a couple of years ago and then just you know over time decided you know I, I don't know if this is this is worth putting out there but um but a, a number of people that i trust and and um and respect have told me that that this is something i need to do so that's the person you trust that. that's why i'm trying to I'm, <laughs> Come on, you know I'm trying. <laughs> like, why would you? Why would you put me up there? Like, hey, Josh, you just throw me up there. I do that to I was you. Like, what, do I look like I'm sleeping or something? Like <laughs> you know, I do that to you all the time. Um, 
Well, here's why. I mean, Dr. Joshua Bowen, uh, I can't even give you credit for the YouTube channel, Josh. No. We got to give Megan all the credit. Yes. But 100%. tell us what this, what you're doing. Plug yourself shamelessly here as an Avenger, uh, especially when you're wearing all those leather suits on the thumbnail, which those are real pictures that I took in person of all of them. Um, their heads are a little bigger for some reason. Maybe their ego. I don't know. Tell us, Dr. Josh. Uh, yeah, so I'm Dr. Josh Bowen. I'm an Assyriologist with uh, a bunch of formal training, graduate training in Hebrew Bible. Uh, mostly I do philology, uh, so I'm like a language sort of guy. Um, but yeah, I, I, I write a lot of uh, books that sort of deal with bad apologetic arguments and I try to bring together specifically uh, looking at the Old Testament uh, or the Hebrew Bible, you know, trying to bring together uh, what it is that the majority or a consensus scholarship says about these topics that apologists like to sort of go to um, in a very uh, poor manner, less than ideal. Uh, so they do things like defend slavery. And so, you know, I wrote a book about it. Um, yeah, but uh, Megan is the one that does Digital Hammurabi. She is absolutely the the brains behind the whole operation. Um, and uh, I know I always say it, but I'm going to plug her again. Uh, she is the uh, host of Bart Ehrman's uh, mm. Misquoting Jesus podcast. So, uh, you know, if you're not if you're not watching her, I don't know what you're doing. You know, you're missing uh, out. That's for sure. <laughs> I really appreciate that. And the website, of course, I did drop down into the chat for everybody. Um, Megan looks somewhat like the cartoon here. Um, <laughs> no imperfections. So right. please go support, check them out. I also forgot to mention, um, Dr. Bird has a book here on Amazon, Permission Granted, Take the Bible Into Your Own Hands. It's on Audible, uh, Kindle. You, you can access it all over the place. So get you a copy of her book. Also, The Atheist Handbook, which is Dr. Josh's book, his second book. He's working on three. When's that going to be out? Oh, don't even ask me that. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm working on the second edition of this guy. Uh, oh, so, let me make you full. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, working on the second edition of that guy. So I'm, I've oh. gone through all the nice. A&E laws and wow. uh, law nice. collections, and I'm looking uh, right now at the old Babylonian stuff, the uh, sale contracts but um just going through anything that has to do with slavery hmm. putting commentary together in a really big appendix and some other stuff to update it so nice. awesome. uh, yeah. that'll come out first but then i'll get going on volume three hey derek mm. yeah i forgot to plug my book that i literally just handed in the manuscript for so it'll still be a few months before it's out okay but it's marriage in the bible basically what do the texts oh, wow. actually say about marriage in the bible and what text should we also be including and having this conversation? And so I'm very excited about it. Um, it is going to be amazing. It is. I can't wait. I'm proud, um, I'm proud of it. I just looked on Amazon awesome. to see if it was something you haven't no. turned it in yet, obviously. No, so. we don't, we're still working on the subtitle even it's kind of, yeah, but. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Well, I rarely, I rarely let out like squeals when <laughs> I see certain, uh, things, but that one was audible oh, uh, when it came thanks. across. Yeah. I'm very excited. Exactly. Yeah, your first book was wonderful, Jennifer, and I really hope people will go and tune in because it's you can tell it's very personal. It's not just an academic thing like this was a journey for mm -hmm. you. Mm -hmm. I'll use the word deconverting from, <laughs> you know, the harmful. Fundamentalist. <laughs> yes, yes, because you have more of a process theological position. And I it's it's obviously not something probably we can get in depth here, but it's very. Sure. No open and i love the the direction you're going you got to encourage people when they do that it's it's a motivator um i'm going to switch seats here with dr josh just to come back over here um we will be plugging when the time comes dr dan mcclellan i figure he deserves his own little uh, seat but i gotta mention this guy this Aww. guy right here dr mott dr matthew monger <laughs> tell us what you do who you are and um i don't have anything to plug you know i would if i could I know you would. Uh, yeah, I'm Matt Munger. Um, I am an associate professor of Near Eastern languages and literatures in Oslo, Norway. So I do I do a little bit of everything. Um, I'm trained. I did my PhD in the Dead Sea Scrolls, and that's how I got to know this this group here. Really, I know Kim uh, pretty well because we he was doing a postdoc in Norway, 
when I was mm. doing my PhD. So we we've spent a lot of time together drinking beer from deer yeah. or deer antlers and stuff like yeah. that that we probably should never have done. Um, and and uh, but yeah, so I I work with I work with uh, with Jewish literature and its reception is basically what I do. So I'm uh, I work with reception history. Um, so I, I work with the Hebrew Bible and the pseudepigrapha the, I've worked a lot with the book of Jubilees and then I, I like to track the way these things get, uh, written, rewritten, reused, recycled, mentioned, transformed in later texts. And so that's kind of my, my way of looking at everything is, is what happens when later readers pick up a text and then recycle it into something new. Wow. So that's kind of, that's my, that's my, my, yeah, I don't, wouldn't call it the love of my life, but it's, it's what I do for a living. <laughs> <laughs> so I just, I have to, I have to say on this point, um, I was, I'm pretty sure it was, uh, it was at uh, SBL either in Chicago or uh, the year after, where was it the year after? Um, Atlanta, Atlanta or Baltimore? Atlanta. Or it was Atlanta. either Chicago, Atlanta, that, uh, Matt's PhD supervisor, uh, the incomparable Liv Ingeborg Lied. Uh, I was at a I was at a, a Nordic uh, reception, and she literally grabbed me, and she dragged me over, and stood me in front of Matt, and said, "This is Matt Monger," and she said to Matt, "This is Kip Davis," and she said, "You guys need to talk to each other," and. The rest is history. Oh, so love that. Oh, yeah. That's nice. yeah. yeah. They yeah. are brothers. They are very like brothers. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> That's very cool. Yeah. I, I just want to say again, thank you for all of you. I wrote you in the private chat, just pretty much showing you love. Like I really appreciate all of you showing up today. You didn't have to, some of you won't be able to stay the whole time. And I want to give everyone in the audience that fair warning that life is life, right? We have things. But I hope that you'll support them because what will bring people back to the channels like David's Deep Drinks podcast and Myth Vision is showing love to the to the guest, to the scholar. Tell them we're reading their book. Show them that we we appreciate them and that kind of stuff. And it, and it and it gives them right. The time is valuable to them. It makes it valuable to them to want to come on. So please show them some love. So we will revisit and check the subscriber count of Deep Drinks yeah, podcast. It's it's funny. I'll do like some. I get I get jumps and subscribers when I do live streams, obviously, but um, not jumps like this already. So um, I thank you everyone who subscribed. I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm overwhelmed already. Um, it's uh, yeah, it's it's really really nice. I've been grinding for a while. You've been on twice, Derek. Um, those episodes yeah. have been amazing, uh, Doctor Josh. You've been on twice, uh, and I'm hoping to have, of course, all the panelists on as well if they're if they're uh, free. Um, but yeah. You've actually, done some real quick, David. You've done some really good interviews, and oh, it's a you. shame what YouTube's doing to your your channel right now. There's no reason you're not breaking a thousand. So, tell well, the, us what's the, what's here. Well, so I so originally it was religion, philosophy, and science, but I I struggled to get much science in there, and I, I found that I was focusing a lot on human rights, so uh, LGBT issues. Um, I'm uh, you know a heterosexual married man, but I like to ally because my first guest on the podcast was a, a, a friend I met in ministry college um, who was closeted for 45 years. So mm. he only recently came out of the closet. And, you know, so that was a big one. Um, I also <clears throat> made friends with um, uh, uh, Anastasia Pereskebova, who is a um, Ukrainian citizen um, living in, in Kharkiv. Um, her father was killed by Russian artillery while standing on the balcony of his Kharkiv home. And stories like hers where she's in Ukraine at the moment, um, and you can still donate to her PayPal, volunteering, bringing aid to um, families, like literally in a war zone. Like in the, if you click on the um, on her episode, you can literally see her running for like on live stream, running for the hallway because airstrikes started happening as mm. we were having the conversation. Mm. It was crazy. Um, it was wow. it was insane. Wow. So for me, you know, getting these. Um, Getting these human rights stories out there. Um, the uh, uh, Alyssa there um, leaving the Mormon Church, she had like a, uh, her, a crazy experience, and she talks about 
you know, sneaking out to have coffee for the first time and things like that. Um, that Ukrainian episode is that one there. If you click on that right at the start, right about five minutes in, uh, you flick through. No, no, about, yeah, so, somewhere in there. Five minutes? Oh, man. Yeah, about five minutes in. You'll see her get up from where she's sitting. Um, and, uh, yeah, she just runs into mm. about runs into the hallway. This is all preamble stuff. But, yeah, it's um, it's crazy just to, just to, to get people – from around the world to tell their stories, but also to focus on the religious and uh, philosophical underpinnings of what makes those things, um, like why those things are happening. Mm -hmm. uh, I try to be quiet, um, quiet. Uh, I, tr I don't try to debate anyone too much on the channel, although I have had Michael Jones on. That's been a great episode where we did debate like, the problems of evil. And I'd, I like to have Christians on and, and Hari Krishnas and everyone in between. Um, <laughs> But uh, but really, Deep Drinks is trying to give a best faith interpretation of someone's story, uh, their their philosophy, their ideas, their um, religious perspective, uh, and yeah. And so, for, for just to just to quickly wrap this up, the reason I wanted to do this panel is like Josh and I are friends, and and we talk all the time. Like, man, how is this slavery apologetic stuff still going around? Like, one, have they not read Dr. Josh's book uh, <laughs> or his other book? Uh, or his other book, like which they should, because they're, they're. I mean, I've, I've seen I've seen at least one review of of Doctor Josh's Slaver book, and I have to say, after after reading the review of it, I I have a clearer understanding of why the apologetic persists. Um, it's not yeah. a good thing, but yeah. No, so uh, yeah, well, so we what we wanted to do, we just wanted to, like I, I said to Josh, like, can we just do a, a, like another episode where we just focus on slavery? And then he's like, you want me to bring Kip? And I was just like, I, he's like, I can ask him. And I was like, oh my god, maybe we should do the panel because talking about doing panels this year, and then that's how it, it it all came together. And Josh has been a big help, uh, and I, I I've never expected to have so many. Um, I never expected to have the A team, like the the team, <laughs> Jennifer, you know, Matthew, like yeah, Dan, like all of you guys. Oh, hey, Dan. Mm. <laughs> like all of Hi, you Dan. guys Dan. Uh, Hello. together. It's just such a wide spectrum of people who, uh, mm -hmm. wide spectrum of even belief systems, but also academia. Like it's incredible um, to have, you know, it's going to be the go-to resource. I have to keep saying that the go-to panel. It's like, if anyone's like arguing slavery, go watch this panel and shut up. Like this is this <laughs> <the> information. <laughs> Like, you know, you know what I mean? Like, if you've got a problem, here are the sources, go argue with the um, academics. Like, right. Yeah. And that's the it's, whole what goal, we're doing, right? Yeah. We're, 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 what we're doing is we're giving people an out to be like, you know what? Go, go watch this and then tell me your, your thoughts after you watch the panel. Like, we don't, so people don't have to keep engaging with like the, the tired arguments of like, it was nice slavery. The master like tickled the mm -hmm. slave as they went mm -hmm. to sleep at night and then, you know, and like gave me back rubs. <laughs> like, it's not. <laughs> You know. You, know, you know what? You know what you tell them when they do that? You just go, all right, let's see it. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't want to see that. No. You know, so we do have our guest here joining us. Uh, finally, Dr. Dan McClellan. Um, he's got a YouTube channel. He's got a huge TikTok. I, if I open up all these links, my computer would probably have a virus. Um, <laughs> but you have your book, Yahweh's Divine Images, A Cognitive Approach, which we're going to be sometime dan with your busy schedule and of course you're doing this full time online mm -hmm. um we're going to cover this more on myth vision but enough about myth vision for a moment i want to shine a light on all of you academics that are here um how can people support what you do how can people help the movement you know what what can we do you've got the youtube tell us about that tell us about your book give us a plug well is this a question directly for me mm -hmm. yes sir Okay, well, I'm I'm in a somewhat enviable maybe position of uh, pivoting to doing this full time, uh, which I'm looking forward a great deal to having the time to be able to commit to uh, to reading the books I want to read, to addressing the topics that I haven't had time to get to in the past, uh, and to engaging full time with. Uh, the academic study of the Bible and religion in a, a public arena. And I've got a few different uh, ways that I'm doing this. I have my book, which uh, there are hard copies for sale, but it's a public access book. And so I have a PDF link on my link tree and I've, I've shared it in a number of different places. So you can access that for free. I'm trying to 
uh, make the scholarship as accessible as possible. At the same time, I, I do uh, hope to make a living, uh, and my uh, my wife and children hope even more that uh, <laughs> that I make a living out of this. So I also have a Patreon. Uh, so folks who do want to uh, support me monetarily can check out the Patreon, and there are incentives that I offer there. And uh, I actually recorded a wonderful interview with uh, Professor Francesca Stavrakopoulou this morning as part of a new mm. podcast that I'm putting get it together with a friend of mine. This is so, going to be good. Yeah, it'll be oh. called the uh, the Data Over dogma podcast and my friend dan beecher uh has been uh he's here in utah he has a, a podcast right now called thank god i'm atheist uh <laughs> that mixes um atheism with with comedy and things like that and and he's a wonderful uh guy and he said we should do a podcast and he's taking care of, care of the technical sides of everything so uh if if it glitches if it seems technically poor that's all on him um, <laughs> come to me if the scholarship seems poor, uh, but we will have something set up to be able to support that as well. Uh, so I've, I'm also working on uh, a, a trade volume, a uh, my first book for a popular audience that will be on how the Bible negotiates its concept of God uh, from early history all the way down to the New Testament. So wow. uh, be on the lookout for that probably next year, early next year. But um, yeah, I'm doing a lot of things now. I'm very excited about uh, about my future, trying to democratize access to the scholarly study of the Bible and religion and combat the spread of misinformation about the same, which is which is fairly widespread. There's a lot of work to be done. And I'm so fortunate and lucky to be supported by these colleagues who are so much better at this than um, than I have been. But I hope to get better at it myself. And, and Dan, Dan wouldn't well, he won't tell you this in his plug, but he's an amazing artist as well. Like in his <laughs> mm. book, I mean, his book is awesome. So everybody should oh, read it. It's a, it's a really yeah. good book. But but the drawings in his book, like I literally had to message him and was like, because I was going to get on him for plagiarizing because he, he <laughs> says that he did him himself. Uh, but 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 then he says he actually did it. Like it's like the it's mm. yeah. Really well, high quality a, stuff. a lot of people notice I really enjoy comic books and all the way up through high school, I wanted to be a comic book artist more than anything else in the world. <laughs> and then I found out how much work they have to do. And, I said, mm, and you decided no to be a biblical yeah. scholar. Well, I, I, uh, I uh, had to go wait tables for a number of years first, wow. get kicked out of the first university I went to. I go spend a couple of years in South America uh, as a missionary. <laughs> do a, a bunch of other stuff before I found uh, what I consider my calling now. So um, yeah, but I have some friends who are comic book artists and I, I wish I could do what they do. It is such a grind. I, I look up to them and I, I bow to them all the time. It's something that wow. I always wanted to do, but I'm just, it's just not me, but to hey, the, I, yeah, so go you ahead, burned so. that gray in your beard. <laughs> I do, hey, do want to mention this. I forgot to mention this because there's so many plugs. I mean, you really have to explore each academic that you go into. Dan's got a Patreon. Kip's got a Patreon. Dr. Bird's got a Patreon. I suspect that Digital Hammurabi has a Patreon. Um, so you can help support. David, do you have a Patreon? Coming soon. Coming soon. Okay. I've been thinking about it. I'm like, why haven't I got a Patreon? But yeah, anyway. <laughs> support your your <laughs> support the people you want to interact with. I suspect they'll be able to answer questions if you have, you know, questions, things like that. Um, maybe they're busy and they get to you at some point. Uh, that typically happens as well. Sometimes I forget, oh my gosh, I've got these, I've got to respond back to people. So help support them. Um, I did have some super chats. Um, Dan, just so you are up to speed, what we're doing is obviously promoting David's Deep Drinks podcast so people can come and watch you in the panel on slavery. Um, I'll hit these up so I don't leave anybody hanging. Just a dude uh, writes, oops, sorry, please discuss the motif of dust in Old Testament, the origin of Apiru in Mesopotamia and their reemergence in the Amarna letters. Next, tell me how the Sumerian... Is it? I can't even. Sumerogram. Yeah. What's the meaning? Ish Sahar. So I'm just sorry. It sounds I'm like a question for those, Josh. I'm trying to figure <laughs> well, out how all those go together. It might be this. So I'm going to keep going, right? So here <laughs> it seems that there are things continuing is not related to Abraham. And even though El Shaddai, probably from Sadu and Isaac, are introduced in the same chapter, and Abraham is the first Hebrew. 
There's a lot there. Uh, yeah. mm-hmm. Okay. I mean, if you go, I, mean, I can tackle some of that. Um, if you want to go back to the first one. Okay. There's a third one too, but please oh. don't, don't, <laughs> don't lose your mind. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, I, okay. So, um, Ishi or Ishi in Sumerian is like, like mountain or peak. Uh, Sahar is like dust. Um, and I noticed that I, I, he said something about a Shadu or Shadum uh, in the second super chat. So I, it's clear there's some sort of connection that he wants to draw here with mountains. So uh, the Habiru or the Apiru or the Abiru, uh, you know, this is a very complicated group of people. Um, <laughs> so they, you know, forgive me if I if I don't remember everything. <laughs> about this uh but they they start to show up i I think in the old babylonian period um you have guys like idrami who's sort of you know one of the stereotypical um opera these are like they're like this tend to be like a an outcast group like a lower social class mercenaries brigands they they're just sort of out there david is sort of considered an opera with his band you know that goes out um but they really sort of come into the historical record, uh, at least in a more well-known sense, during the Amarna period. Um, and they show up at the site. Of, so they show up in the Amarna letters um, as sort of a, an antagonist for the local petty kings there in Canaan. Um, they also show up in the city of Nuzi. Uh, God, I don't know how all of this is connecting to dust and <laughs> mountain. Uh, but but so I don't you think the question then is well at least the apiro thing is probably because that people want to connect it to some kind of hop bureau Hebrew. Absolutely. So it's just trying Absolutely. to make it. So I think yeah. that's the that's the okay. inference that I see in the in the question. So it's obviously a little dated at this. Point, but it's a pretty good three article um, series by Meredith Klein back in the 50s where he tackled this in three three pretty substantial articles. Of course, it's been written about uh, much more recently, but um, addressing this very issue, is there this connection between Ivri, the Hebrew word uh, for like Hebrew? You see it. It's really debated in like Exodus 21, 2 to 6. So when you have an Evid Ivri, a, a Hebrew slave, is this somehow connected either etymologically, which I think you could make a stronger case. I don't think a strong case, but a stronger case for an etymological connection. Uh, but certainly, uh, anyway, so, so the options are, um, uh, are these the Habiru? Uh, are these these like lower class mercenaries? At Newsy, they, they get into these slave contracts where... Uh, they serve, they're generally foreigners, they don't have to be, but they serve uh, the master uh, by contract for a period of time until the master dies, and then they uh, get uh, manumitted by adoption, and they inherit, and so, like, is are these foreigners in Exodus 21? It's a whole thing. I want to be quiet, frankly. <laughs> um, well, on the, on the second page of that question, it asks about eperum slash dust. Is... Uh, is it possible it's wondering if there's an etymological connection between apiru and eperum? Hmm. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, I love that. I love that we're trying to work out what the question is asking, <laughs> and not, <laughs> so, not just answer. <laughs> yeah, not just what how to answer. It. Yeah. So I, mean, I think I, like my so my my uh, feeling here is that we just need to just take a step back from the idea that there are words that show up in Akkadian texts that have etymological similarities to words that show up in Hebrew texts um, and and say that we, even though you find a series of words that are similar, <laughs> um, it it doesn't mean that there is a, is a causal relationship mm-hmm. between these things. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. the fact that the words for laughter and dust and mountain and whatever are etymologically related and maybe even show up in some certain texts together. It doesn't mean that the Abraham cycle was written to recycle those texts in any way. Like, I think that's the, 
that's my feeling, at least about this this kind of question, since I I also don't know exactly what's going on behind the question <laughs> right. here. But yeah, thank you for addressing yeah. that. But thank you for the super chats. Yeah, yeah. seriously, A train. Here comes the A train. Notice me, Simpai Simpai Kip. <laughs> Simpai Kip. Who doesn't, who doesn't <laughs> love A train, guys? <laughs> thank you love so you, much, A train. Max the Confessor actually red pill equals Andrew Andrew Tate Mimesis. Yeah. Canceled. Yeah, I would say that's definitely a false genealogical connection on my intro. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You're a huge Tate Andrew Tate Mimesis. fan, right, Derek? You're yeah. Tell me, uh, tell me off stream. You just love love Andrew. You're gonna shake yeah. your head and everything. It's mm -hmm. weird. I get all these notifications. His stuff comes up too often in my feed. I'm like, what in the world? <laughs> Like they yeah, want me to do a hit piece on them or something. Um, Gnostic informant in the house. This panel is fire. Yeah, it is. That's sweet. <laughs> if you haven't subscribed to Gnostic informant, you will end up on fire after. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you need to subscribe. <laughs> Scott Duke in the house. Dr. Kill, I caught your talk uh, with Pine Creek. How does LXX handle the his train filled the temple translation of Isaiah 6 1? Other panelists' thoughts. Okay, so so everyone knows what we're talking about here. This is uh, this is Isaiah chapter six verses one. Six verse one, uh, Yahweh was um, Isaiah saw Yahweh seated on a throne, high and exalted, and his whatever it is, his shulim filled the temple. Um, I I did a I I, I did a, a one hour uh, stream a couple days ago where I. Uh, attempted to provide uh, the the information and some of the the background to why certain readings of this text. Um, most recently, uh, Francesca Stavrakopoulos in uh, in God and Anatomy could potentially be uh, with reference to to uh, Yahweh's genitals. So, an important aspect of this investigation is. Uh, the Septuagint. I mean, really, one of the things that the biblical scholars do, and uh, I'm just going to pause right here and say, if you're interested in knowing more about this, about you know, this particular passage, just this this verse and how to unpack it as a as a scholar, um, I'm going to be on Gnostic Informant this evening uh, with Pat Lowinger, um, and we're gonna we're gonna talk about about Yahweh's junk. So. Cool. So come and come and see. Um, the uh, so one of the things that I do when I'm approaching a text is I I go and I look and see what because there are ancient translations already of biblical text and I go and look and see what translations are doing with the text and I do this not just to try and get a better sense of the words the Hebrew words that sometimes are are unfamiliar to us. Um, I do this as a way to see sometimes you can you can gain some clues or some ideas about what people in antiquity were thinking about how did this how did this text fit their own uh, theological program so the septuagint's really interesting in this regard because the translation in the septuagint goes typically you know it's it's pretty typical um, you know in the year that king Uzziah died uh, Yahweh, it says Yahweh saw the, uh, Yahweh saw, uh, the, I believe it says Yahweh saw the glory of Yahweh seated, uh, seated on a throne high and lifted up. And then it says his glory filled the temple. And I, I suggest this is interesting and you need to come and watch Neil's channel tonight, Gnostic, Gnostic Informants channel tonight, six o'clock Pacific, to get the whole the whole rundown of this. There it is. Um, I think this is very interesting because elsewhere in the Septuagint, where this word is used, uh, he's going to do one of two things. He's going to translate it as uh, hem of a garment, as in uh, the, the Exodus occurrences where it's describing the, the robe of the priest, um, the, the Septuagint explicitly says, yes, this is the hem of his garment. In uh, passages in the prophets where this is indicative of a, a woman's 
uh, pubic area or genitalia, the Septuagint will translate that with uh, opistia or opiso, which means back or, you know, maybe, maybe ass. So it's very telling that when you get to this one instance in Isaiah chapter six, verse one, the translator of the Septuagint doesn't go with either of those and says the glory of Yahweh filled the temple. Um, so to me, as a scholar, when I'm looking at this, and this is the uh, Septuagint's translated sometime in the, you know, third, second century uh, BC, depending on which text they're talking about. I think this is revealing about uh, not only what the, the Septuagint translator thought the passage meant, but then how he tried to um, fix it. <laughs> massage it make it palatable to his audience and i'd appreciate hearing from some others about this as well i know there have been a go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> i i know there have been a couple other um scholars who have argued that that this could be a reference to genitals at least one kind of explicitly uh, as a reference to genitals, and another suggests that it's kind of playing on the ambiguity of the word and toying with the fact that it is both covering and also revealing, and kind of just hinting at uh, Isaiah's use of this of this poetry to talk about God's, um, you know, most intimate, most secret parts being uh, covered as well as exposed, and Isaiah having access to. Um, that those parts, uh, at least being being able to see them, uh, and I know um, Professor Stavrakopoulou, uh, <laughs> she she finds the fascination, or, or at least the objection to this reading, this you know one page in in her five hundred plus page book, um, kind <laughs> yeah. of silly, particularly when she spends more time talking about Ezekiel one, which has a, right? a, a similar discussion of. What is visible about God that focuses for some time as well on God's loins, which is which is the word that that is there in Ezekiel one. Uh, and so it, it just strikes me as as kind of silly that we pull out our fainting couches on Twitter because somebody had the nerve to point out that. They could talk about these things anciently. They weren't the Victorian. Um, people that we like to think the biblical authors were and you know you can go look in rabbinic literature as well and they're seriously contemplating the nature of god's genitals as well they're yep. talking about is was adam born circumcised well adam was made in the image of god god was Must circumcised me. so yes <laughs> adam was born yeah. circumcised certainly and so yep. in the ancient world this stuff was not as taboo as a lot of people like to think it yeah. was I uh, think it. Um, a lot of people treat it today, and so yeah. this is this is just another example of folks who have renegotiated away a lot of the substance of what was written in these texts, and are now having to push back against scholarship that is more accurately reconstructing how things were understood in the ancient world as somehow weird as somehow gross as somehow <laughs> anti-biblical uh, mm -hmm. and um, it's just i had ludicrous. i had one guy i heard one guy say that the the suggestion to read it in this way is is possibly anti-semitic yeah, i don't so know weird. how yeah. um, i know i mean if people i just huh. want to encourage everyone if people think that like it's taboo in the ancient world to talk about penises in <laughs> Mythological text. There's hey, a world. <laughs> right, yeah. you've, you've not met him. No. Go, go to the uh, ETCSL. Search on ETCSL Sumerian yeah. and search mm. on penis, and Read, you will just see uh, the, how Enki digs his penis into the ground yeah. and ejaculates and creates. Right. It's mm. what he Which does. I gotta yeah. say is yeah. super. That, I mean, I think I think that's weird in in any context that anyone would would do that with their piece of penis. <laughs> 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 That might just but, be me. I don't... But, as, the, as, the most un, as the most uneducated person on this panel, um, something that I, I wanted to throw a thought out there that um, you guys can maybe comment on, that something that I find interesting is people will often take the Bible and put it in a modern context, and it almost makes it insulting. Like, say, like I, I'm, not, I'm an agnostic atheist, right? I don't, I'm not convinced of the existence of God, but it's almost insulting to God 
say, yeah, it's, it's not a product of its time. It's not, it's not, it wasn't this, uh, this book written by people who didn't really understand the cosmos and were, were trying to piece together things. These are actually divine instructions. Like to, to me that, that it almost paints God as like, or it almost dishonors the text or makes it, um, to, to put it in its modern context. Do you, do, do you guys know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, it's almost insulting. It's like, you're saying, you're telling me that God told the Amalekites to go, to go the Israelites to go kill the Amalekites, like, and the infants. Like, you, you're saying the creator of the universe said that? Like, to me, it's like, it's like, it's, it's, uh, it's like, I, well, I made this joke. It's like, so I'm um, about Josh. It's like, um, you know, you know, someone was asking, is slavery wrong? Like, why is slavery wrong? And right, he's like, he, right. Josh isn't saying that. Josh is saying that you're saying the creator of the universe is telling people to own other people as slaves. And he's saying, stop teasing God. It's not okay <laughs> to tease God. Like, you know, so <laughs> thoughts. Uh, I'd like to get Dr. Bird's thought. I know she's, you're not a yeah. Hebrew Bible scholar, right. but you know this. You hear what's going on. And what is your take as a female scholar on this? On God's junk? Or yeah. On- <laughs> 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 I, I like to joke about how often circumcision is really the issue. Like it's all about men's penises all over the place, right? Yeah. It's just not everything's about your dick, man. It, exactly. But like <laughs> you really need to we gotta pull Paul aside on that because he it really is about his dick a lot. Way more than <laughs> you'd, you'd think. Um yeah. uh wow. I, I actually lost the train of thought. I you know, <laughs> listening to David's comment and question and you know, I'm you know, my background, I'm like, yeah, it's not just my background, but the students, I, I do teach Old Testament or Hebrew Bible intros year round. And, and mm-hmm. how often do I have in the same class, you know, people who are, who would probably identify as atheist, trying to have a conversation with, uh, with other students who are defending the depiction of God, right? So mm-hmm. I agree wow. with you, David, and your observations, which come out of reason. Um, but when people are reared, or grow up or whatever, you know, being taught to agree with all this. And it's really impressive the kinds of mental gymnastics people will learn to do just automatically and find a way to be okay with or to accommodate. And no, 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 that's, you know, somehow it's it's justified. And then because of that, I I just today was reading someone, you know, I asked, asked my students to, okay, put yourself in the position of the Israelites as you're trying as at the beginning of Joshua, right? And this conquering of the land and destroying people town after town after town, you know, and how does, how, how does this description in Joshua affect the way you're going to think about the Canaanites? And so I asked them to, to, to answer that. And then I asked them, okay, now put yourself in the position of the Canaanites in this story. Story. What is your, how are you going to be thinking about the Israelites? And, and it is stunning the things that students will say because they've grown up finding ways to accommodate this violence. And I even had, I mean, today, literally, I'm not like two hours ago, three hours ago, I just graded a student's response. And he's like, well, if I was a Canaanite, I would forgive the Israelites because they're just doing what God told them to do. Wow. Yeah. Well, that and that you know, I use I, I have similar discussions where sure. I yeah. talk about you know, put yourself in the Yazidi shoes, and <laughs> ISIS mm-hmm. is coming after you. These are these are similar kind of relationships. And right. is your authoritative literature how is it going to treat ISIS? Right. I mean, how do we treat ISIS when when we talk about them? And that's you know, not a defense of them, but it's just to suggest there are all kinds of dynamics going on that we frequently are not even aware of them, much less able to put ourselves in those shoes. So that's a, mm-hmm. that's a wonderful um, illustration. And, um, and yeah, I think a lot more people could do to, to be put in your class, Jennifer, and, <laughs> and be made to think here, here. about those things and then be made to yeah. answer those questions. Mm. If I could for, for Dr. Bowen, just a moment, he's, he's having to go. I'm sure um, the kids and the whole nine, Josh, if I want to plug you real quick here, <laughs> Um, your books, you've got more books coming out. You've got your website, wherever I have that at. Oh, here it is. And your YouTube or really Megan's YouTube, Digital Hammurabi, which you just, uh, you're, you're just there. You're just there. So final plug from you. <laughs> yeah, no, I really appreciate, uh, just the opportunity to be on this panel, uh, frankly, cause these are some, some dynamite voices in this community and minds. And, um, 
Yeah, I'm super excited that uh, that both Kip and Dan are you know being able to to do this you know sort of forward facing um, social media stuff full time because we need it desperately. Mm-hmm. And if you haven't subscribed yet, sneak over there real fast, open up another tab, and subscribe to a Deep Drinks podcast. Let's get him up to a thousand because uh, it's going to be a big panel when we get over there. And mm-hmm. they got a new baby, right? So if you do it for no other reason, mm-hmm. do it for the new baby. <laughs> thank you guys for having me on and uh i will i will talk to you all again very soon all right thank you josh Thanks, thank you Jessica. Thanks, guys. Yeah. awesome all right he's gone we could talk no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, so I, I just wanted to i just wanted to jump in on that discussion we had before just for just for a second because i think one of the big things that that people don't get with this whole problems of thinking of God with having private parts and whatever is like just that our translations just hide it. Like, I mean, I honestly think that the best translation of the, of the thing in Isaiah six one is like dangly bits or something, you know, that's awesome. because it's literally, it's, that's what it means. Like the word means the thing that's hanging there And, and it's used as an adjective to say like the dangly bit of the robe. Right. And, and that, and so the hanger downs. it's the hanger down, the down, <laughs> hanger, the, you know, and, and so it's like, it, it's, it's not as confusing if you're used to seeing and the down hanger of God filled up the temple. Like, and because every, it would just make you be like, Oh wait, what is God's down hanger? What is that actually? Mm-hmm. But because mm-hmm. people say, no, 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 we cannot say something like that. Let's say mm-hmm. it's the, it's the robe because that's an Exodus. And the then, train of the robe, the tr- mm-hmm. which is it, right. it's and, one and, that I'm like, well, yeah, and it's, the, it's and, the hanging bit of the robe, right? And yeah. and that's the that's what it, the, as an adjective, that's what it's used for. Yep. Say because the, you have the robe, and where the robe hangs down, yep. you do these things. Like that's how you decorate it. That's what the laws are about. So you're supposed right. to decorate yep. the hangy bit of the robe, <laughs> and and it's just that in Isaiah, the robe is not mentioned. So there's, there's no room there, man. And so what does then this <laughs> nominalized thing say? Well, it's the dangly yeah. bit. Ooh, I just, so. I love that we're spending so much time. Like, I, I spent the rest of the panel talking about how giant. This is the best. I love this. <laughs> now, Dan, I don't want to be a kill. move on. <laughs> no, 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 no! I want to hear Dan. Dan, go ahead. I, well, well, I was, I was about to say, I don't want to be a killjoy, but there are a bunch of other. Uh, super chat questions yeah. as well and <laughs> okay okay doc pluralmanat can we assume cyrus was a devotee of ahura mazda and and the marduk cult influencing the authors of isaiah 40 to 48 his victory could be could then be seen as a solidarity between avesta and yahweh worshipers hmm. whoever wants to tackle it or mention whatever I think this is something, this is a question that scholars have had for a long time. The problem is we don't have a ton of overlap between biblical scholars who can also engage the history and the literature of old Persian. uh, And we don't have a ton of material data uh, for that overlap as well. And so I I think many scholars would probably say it seems likely. I mean, there's, Mm -hmm. uh, there's uh, means, opportunity, motive, all that kind of stuff. Uh, And so... (laughs) It seems likely, but we don't really know for sure. Um, and so there's there's not much we can say beyond maybe. Thank you, Dan. Appreciate yeah. that. Shane Torres, y'all have had a huge impact on my recent deconstruction, mm. especially Dr. Josh. Thank you all. Question. I want to study Old Testament Hebrew Bible academically. What area should I focus on and where should I study? <laughs> focus on the language and the literature. And um, just just hammer away at that. But yeah, areas is, is uh, just up to you. That's whatever whatever blows your hair back. You said that so smooth. That that, <laughs> actually, that sounded cool. Like, <laughs> <laughs> don't tell my kids that because um, I'll never hear the end of that. But this is actually a question I I get quite a bit. I uh, I get messages all the time across all my platforms. I can't even read them all, but a lot of them are. I'd like to get into studying mm. this academically. Mm. I'm about to go to college. I'm a, I want to go to grad school. What should I study? How should I study it? And um, yeah. 
And yeah, I think most most of the time people are going to tell you, get your languages, get your your literature down, read primary sources in, in original languages. And if you can if you can iron that out, then whatever floats Good your job. boat. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Thank you again. Nitty in the house says we are <laughs> PhD vision. <laughs> yes. That's fun. That's Me fun. and David are the only ones lacking the PhD, but hey, you know. <laughs> A train's back again. Says, Does Yahweh have an OnlyFans, Dr. Kev? <laughs> I would. I have said this recently, and I don't know. We're back on that topic. I don't want to spend too much time on, but I do wonder if there was an English translation that we would somehow have funded that would like just let the ugly or even mm -hmm. the sexual be said. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think it'd sell more, at least to a more secular world. Like bring a lot of like, people back to church. I'll tell you that. It might. <laughs> like Game of Thrones, right? We know there's some mushy, gushy, crazy stuff in that yeah. show, but it's good entertainment. I think this would make the Bible even more entertaining than just trying to understand. And the glory of his robe filled. <laughs> it's like his dangling parts were there, you know, like, whoa, what is this? I don't know. What do you think? Somebody if, may if be working on a translation fans, like that. Oh, oh. Uh oh, are you are you working on a translation Ooh. like that? Yeah, I am working that? on a translation. Oh, oh. Yeah. oh. Wow. I, that's one of the one of the reasons I decided to pivot to doing this full time. I've been I've been picking away at this, but it's taken so long and it's such a lot of work that um, I'm I want to be able to dedicate more time to that. And it's intended to be a purely academic non-confessional, non-devotional translation so that people in a classroom don't have to spend all their time correcting the translation that they're using. <laughs> I don't know I if mean, any of you have ever- I've uh, never had that no. issue. No. We, don't. No, we don't do that. Oh my goodness, Dr. Bird, <laughs> your work on marriage and stuff, like you already are going, goodness, we have to undo. Yeah. So. Yeah. yeah. Can I just say, uh, Dan, uh, uh, everyone actually but dan like i've read out your credentials i read everyone's credentials to my roommate yesterday and like what you guys like i was like i was like oh this is the panel got he was angry he was like actually like he got offended like <laughs> how old are these people how do they have like, <laughs> like are they 80 years old when have they had any life like how like and i was like no look at like they're, they're all young like relatively young and like you know and he's just like what no. how do they have like masters bachelors phds like how do they have all this and i was and he actually got angry at like how old <laughs> you guys were so yeah quick moment before we keep moving forward i want everybody now watching subscribe to all our guests yeah, but yeah. we're trying to get deep drinks i haven't refreshed it at the end i'm gonna refresh this we're gonna see with the 340 people watching if we how close can we get to 1000 subscribers we started at 600 and like what was it 30 something 40 something or 50 i can't remember i think but so yeah 650 something like that. i think so be on the lookout we're gonna we're gonna update you at the end uh, let me just throw, let me just throw one more thing into yeah. Dan's uh, translation thing there because I have a I have a friend and uh, Kip knows him too, don't you, uh, Morton? Uh, oh, that UER Beckman. Yeah. Ah, yeah. yeah. So Morton. he's a he, yeah. So he's a he's a good friend of mine. He did his PhD on confessional translations in into Norwegian, yeah, and wow. and he got to look at the archives from the Bible oh, Society. Yeah. And he started asking questions and and they got himself like into some some pretty murky places where you made like that. I mean like where they would have you know you had your Hebrew Bible Hebrew expert suggested a translation and then a committee would approve it and send the next committee and got up to the final committee and they said oh no they might forget about Jesus and they just change it and oh. it was just like I mean it, and there was like there was no question that this was done at the final stage by the confessional committee that just said, we don't want this in our Bible. Yeah. He and, actually, and was, I, and he, yeah. You could show several, like, and in a lot of Christ, Christological readings in the new Testament. Oh, and just, yeah. I mean, it's all kinds of stuff where he would say like, what, what happened? Who would suggest this among our, our scholars? And, and there wasn't one, there wasn't a scholar who had suggested it. It was someone on the confessional committee. Wow. It's, it, if I remember correctly, uh, he actually, be, I mean, before he even finished, he he had already made the national news. Oh yeah, because of this, right? Yep, it was yeah. Mm, I yeah. you know if if my Norwegian was stronger, I I would I would read the dissertation. But uh, yeah, it sure it sure looked sure looked like a good one. 
All right, I'm going to knock these out here. As there's a lot building up as Dan has an all-seeing eye here. Part one, uh, Hung Fa Shur. <laughs> and I think he's trying to say he's hung for sure. I don't know. Have a Josephus. I have a Josephus. I was listening to a lecture about Joe in regards to facing Roman troops. He is trying to explain to his troops. He says, if we fight new recruits, we can try and fight them. But if we meet... With veterans, run away, and they will kill you. Where? This is a Steve Mason question. I have a Josephus. I was listening that's to- That's a Josephus about- question. So that's a question, question mark. So he has a Josephus question. But the question oh, is just Josephus where question. is- Does Josephus address this question? This- I suspect. Mm. Mm. He's trying to explain to his troops. He says, if we fight new recruits, we can try and fight them. But if we meet with veterans, run away, or they will kill you. Where? I don't know where. That would be a Steve Mason. Like I said, yeah. he he would be like, oh, I know exactly where and exactly what book. And- is this is this part of is is this part of uh, um, uh, Josephus's uh, biography that he narrates, where he talks about? Um, uh, where where he talks about his his heroic surrender to the Romans, I don't know. I'm I'm yeah. I don't know. I am absolutely spitballing here. I have no idea. Okay, so real quick before we go, Doctor Bird, I gotta give you I gotta give you a plug here because I know you before you go. Um, let me pull you up here on the screen if I know how to work my own system. Uh, your website. Yeah, people can go to the website. They could find the book that way. They could find YouTube. They could find your podcast. They could find my Patreon. Everything. Mm-hmm. Patreon. Tell us how. A, can- well, and I have like like I don't know how much to, but you know, like I have a video series uh, that was created for communities of faith to work through what the Bible says about marriage. I created the video series first, and now I'm writing the book, and that'll be out in a few few months. Um, I do have a podcast, Wild Olive, game-changing conversations about literature, culture, and the Bible. Yeah. Um, I don't have all the episodes listed here, but just go. You can get them. You can access it through Apple or or Stitcher or uh, what's the one I don't like? Spotify. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, but yeah, anywhere you get your podcast, you can find Wild Olive. Um and what else? I mean, I have some editorials that I wrote back in the teens about the like back with Huffington Post, but the conversations are still kind of all happening, you know, about politics and, and scripture. Um, what else can I tell you? My YouTube channel, I'm trying to talk about, you know, do short bits for reconsidering what the Bible says or how to read what's in there. Um, Mm -hmm. Reading through economic and political lenses often helps to understand some of the stories attributed to Jesus in ways that are actually make them make more sense versus mystifying or spiritualizing them all, which is how I was taught growing up. Um, What else can I tell you about what I'm doing? Your YouTube go subscribe, of course. Yeah. And, and and stay in you know stay close if they become a patron can't they message you uh, yes yeah i have um i have a, i just have a handful of patreons right now or patrons right now but some of them do contact me every now and then which is fun you know i suppose if there were a lot of people doing that it'd be hard to manage but when someone reaches out with a question you know it's great yeah i will say this to make it easy if you're looking for all of these sources you can go to our website jennifergracebird.com patreon mm-hmm. youtube uh what's the v vimeo, the vimeo yeah it's yeah, the, the, series. the videos are there also but they're I, but you can also access the videos on my personal website so either one you know two places where you can get the videos yeah facebook twitter the whole yeah. nine go support yeah. our scholars here dr bird thank you so much for for giving us your time and hanging out with us and- yeah you all are fun <laughs> <laughs> i hate to leave a little fomo going on i don't want to miss anything but i'm going to so well you're we'll gonna do it again that on <laughs> david's channel yeah no i know that's the purpose of this stream. It's sure. not like yeah. nobody's getting uh, accused of why didn't you hang out with us longer? You know, like, <laughs> yeah, I, no, I'm I, looking I forward can't to the wait to Jennifer. I just have to say your work has been like, I didn't know who mm. you were until Dr. Josh mentioned you. And then I've been mm. doing a deep dive into your work and I am mm. just like blown away. Um, oh, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Really, I responded really... to your email, by the way. I don't, I'm sure oh. you haven't seen it yet. So no, yeah. I haven't seen it yet. Yeah. But... Yeah. Thank you. Okay. I'm looking Thank forward you. to it. Yes. Oh, yes. It's nice to meet you guys. Bye. Uh, virtually. Yeah. Thank yep. you, Dr. See Bird. You. Yep. Nice. See you soon. Yes.
All right. All right. Anyone want to answer that last super chat? Did you find it, Dan? I have not. I've looked through. I've got uh, multiple of Mason's volumes. I've got um, Goodman's translation of the war. Uh, I can't. I I search them for uh, veteran, for recruit. Somebody Uh, said. I found in book two. um, This is. I mean, it's uh, two fifty five. It's about Herod's veteran soldiers. And that's like, that's the only thing I found. I, I, I don't, I didn't really get the reference, but apparently there was something about some veteran soldiers. Um, but other than that, I, 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 so I don't, I don't know. I, I haven't heard of that particular anecdote uh, from Josephus. Um, I guess it's, I'll save it for Steve. Cause we got so many, I'm, I, I literally, you know, the worst feeling I get as a host is there's a lot of people who love watching us and want to ask questions yeah. and I can't get to them all. And the next thing you know, everyone's got to go. And then I'm yeah. feeling guilty oh. because I, I can't force guests to stick around and answer all these. So we'll just be mindful that there's like 20 super chats to get yeah. through. So Let's just, okay. we'll talk, we'll talk quickly. Yeah. And, and if there's something that Let's I do, do need to address, I'll email Steve Mason. I have, Academics at my, uh, what do you what do you say? At Beck my, and call disposal. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Good soul. Thank you for the super chat. Did the did the fluidity of the Hebrew Old Testament affect the LXX text? Is the Septuagint also textually corrupted, like change or poor translation? How fluid is Old Testament? There's a. This is a fascinating. This is, I think, some of the most fascinating stuff text critically about the Hebrew Bible because the Septuagint. Uh, preserves a lot of very different readings from the Masoretic text. And the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls shows that that wasn't necessarily because of translator exegesis, which is what a lot of people used to say was the the reason for this. But for instance, Jeremiah is uh, 15-ish percent shorter in the Septuagint. And we've found a handful of fragments of Jeremiah at Qumran that seem to attest to a version of this text in Hebrew that's much closer to the Septuagint's reading. And so some point along the way that got expanded. Uh, there are other ways that the Septuagint itself is expanding on the text. There are a number of, uh, of kind of proclivities the Septuagint translators have. And you can go look at the work of uh, Amelie, uh, Annelie Amelaeus, who talks a lot about uh, how The earlier translators were a lot more strict and resulted in more wooden translations. And then the later translators are a little more free. But then when you get to the recensions in the second century CE, they kind of go back and you get the Kaiga recension and uh, where it's being very, very literal and very. uh, And I would argue that that's where the concept of the text as the primary locus of the authority of the story becomes more important and people start to say the text is what is most important rather than the concepts or the story. But yeah, there is, there's a lot of fluidity going on. The Septuagint translators had very different source texts in front of them and they were also doing a lot more with the text, but trying to suss out where it's a, it's an alternate source text versus where the translator is reading it differently is is a complex, but I think fascinating uh, field of uh, of textual criticism, and I'm sure the others can say um, even more fascinating things about it if they Absolutely. want to. Well, I know Kip can have some. St- I already know he's there's, thinking of it. <laughs> so there's, I mean, there's a lot to say, um, and I I just I feel like for t- for the sake of time, yeah. It's just not something we can get into. Um, if I could, if I could do a shameless plug, part three of my video series is actually entitled "What Is a Biblical Text?" Part three of my Desi School series, where I I go into this question and this idea of uh, f- scriptural fluidity in some depth, and try and unpack what that even looks like uh, in the Second Temple period. Thank you, Kip. Yeah, everybody go subscribe. Alan Bird, do the guests know the commentary reading Romans in context? It user it uses Second Temple Judaism text to expound on the epistle. If so, is it worth buying? Anybody read that? I, I don't know it. Sorry. Um, I'm, anything, I'm anything. Right oh, good. I was going to say anything that uses Second Temple Judaism to expound the New Testament is 
is probably a worthwhile investment. I don't recognize the um, the authors: Ben Blackwell, mm. John Goodrich, Jason Mastin. Mm. I don't um, know those names. Who's the publisher? It, Zondervan. Uh, yeah. So it's going to be it's going to be a little more on the conservative side, yeah. probably. And I I imagine it is in a conservative approach to the new approach to Paul, which tries to resituate Paul within a Jewish context, but in many ways just reinscribes a lot of contemporary Protestant ideologies into Judaism. And so there have been a lot of criticisms of that approach as well. And so I, I but I, I have no idea. I have not read this book. That's just my assumption based on other stuff. And I'm, I don't mean to uh, Bogart <laughs> these whole conversations. No, so no. I'm dang. sorry to be the one to, to Are be- you kidding? Get off, that out guilt of out of here. Who told <laughs> they, you that you were guilty? Who so, told yeah. you, Dan? <laughs> I, but I, I, can, I can just throw in, I have read one chapter of it. So it's an, it's an anthology. Oh. It's not a, a commentary, like a traditional verse-by-verse -verse commentary. It's, a, it's, a, it's an anthology of different people that have written articles where they take Second Temple Jewish texts and use them to uh, shed light on texts from Romans. And there's one on Jubilees and Romans 2 um, and about circumcision and and stuff like that, I think. And um, I'm trying to remember the name of the person. I'm trying to find it. But um, uh, uh, it is, I just, I feel like if I mention things, I should say that name. Sarah Whittle, um, Jubilees and Romans 2, 6 to 29, circumcision, law, obedience, and ethnicity. And it's a, it's a good, it's a good article. It, um, so yeah, but I've just read it because it's, it was because of the Jubilees connection. Yeah. But, so there's, there's good stuff there, but I, I don't think it'll give you a, a good comprehensive view of Romans or anything, but it can help you see what some scholars are doing with, um, trying to connect sec second temple Judaism and, and Paul. Thank you, thank you. Chat GPT, thank you for the super chat. The first book, Gilgamesh, is a gay romance story? Well, it's bisexual, but yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. we agree. Thank you, thank you so much, chat. <laughs> Paul, uh, <laughs> unpack Yahweh's junk. Hope, Ho Owen doesn't call in. Hoven. 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 Yeah. Hoven. <laughs> <laughs> isn't he, uh, isn't he on about whale penises still? Uh, I'm not, I'm uh, not sure. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I love that. Um, that's such a funny skit that a uh, godless engineer would play. You know, <laughs> well, pen and well, penis. <laughs> um, Gnosis Brosis. When all the best religious studies YouTubers are in the same stream, do you have to keep Dr. Tabor in a secure location as the lane survivor? <laughs> like he was, so he was in the chat. <laughs> it was, was he? Yeah, yes. he was in the chat. So oh. he was. He was more or less here. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Tabor, he's sometimes he'll, he'll sneak in on me to check on me and make sure I'm doing the right thing. And I'm just kidding. Um, we've got that Mark course mentioning him. That's fantastic. If you haven't checked it out, please do. But thank you, Gnosis Brosis. And thank you for being a Brosis. Keep it up. Cheryl Lyle, thank you again for being a member oh, and the super chat. I mean, Cheryl's everywhere and shows shares all of the content from all of you out there all over social media. Hot panel, Dr. Bird. I've heard you speak about the 144 male virgins in Revelation. Oh, she's not here. Can you go deeper with this? Others as well. Um, sorry, Cheryl, that D Dr. Bird had to pull out. And in fact, this um, stream, you know, you might find one of the academics on the panel that eventually might have to go or something. And that's that was kind of the nature of this beast today. Um, but I can message this to her to get her thoughts. But would any of the panel like to tackle this idea? Dan, I know you have something <laughs> to say. No, no. I, <laughs> I would, I, I have no, I, I don't know what Dr. Bird's position on this is, and they're not interested in my position on this, but in hers. And so I, I wouldn't be able to do that any justice. We'll do, we'll do I, some. I do just, Derek, I do want to say I just got an email from Jennifer confirming that she'll be the last guest on Deep Drinks podcast before the panel. So, uh, so if you want to ask that question again, well, I'll answer, I'll, I'll ask her that question on Deep Drinks. So, if you yes. want to, thank you. Nice. 
Thank you, David, for coming through. Uh, Obviously, I was going to plug Kip because Kip was mentioning his series here, which here's another plug. But uh, Deep Drinks, we're going to check this. We're going to be checking this at the end. All right. Um, (laughs) Doc Pleromonaut, Dr. B, Dr. Bird. Oh, man. The the timing here. Maybe maybe you should start taking notes, David. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Paul has slaves obey your has slaves obey your master thoughts on his lack of concern that what's this a greek word or something duly, oh, duly that duly. that's a word yeah. for slave slave yeah. had no recourse for breeding purposes despite the rising ethnos of female manumission paul was staunchly status quo despite persons not distinguished by god this might be worth bringing up on the stream as well because you're getting into slavery yeah sure, right? sure. i'm sure mm-hmm. she'll talk to to this kind of thing on the on okay the yeah no doubt Hmm. doc when you go over there you got to drop a wizard emoji and let like david know hey i'm coming from myth vision and uh hmm. i'm sure david will figure out a way to make it work yeah they oh thank Understand. you for the massive super chat by the way that's wow. huge thank you so much for that love i really appreciate that um zachary johnson says what is going on with jordan peterson is he still an atheist or agnostic <laughs> It would take him three days to answer that question. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Good one. I like the cosmic skeptic uh, video that he did on that. I don't know if you all saw that, but he's in practicality. Like, you know, he sounds like an atheist in some ways, but I don't want to title anybody or pigeonhole anybody. Well, he he knows what side of his bread is buttered. Mm. Yeah. I think you're right about that. I've said that in some of my videos, so. Yep, he takes the the meaning fundamentalist atheist to a completely different side of the scale. I think, like he, I mean, like you know, there's some fundamentalist atheists that are really hardcore, um, anti-Christian, anti-religion, like fight yeah. it tooth and nail. But he's like just flirts with conservative fundamentalist Christians in just such a crazy way, like it. Mm. Uh, it, I, I'm always I'm always surprised at what what he what he says. So it's a it's a really weird combination of of yeah quasi. Yeah, I don't want to. I don't even know what to call it. But anyway, yeah. <laughs> yeah. S- Scott Duke <laughs> says my Hebrew instructors in seminary said nothing about dangly bits in any passage of the Old Testament. Uh, well, I Scott, am, I where am, did you go to school, man? <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say I am unsurprised, but then I'm also saddened and surprised. Yeah. Um, this is so. This is something from a. I, I saw something similar uh, to this on on Twitter, espoused by a supposed PhD uh, holder in biblical studies who went to my grad school, which oh, is yeah. also the same grad school that uh, that Dan attended. And I was like, "Were you sick that day, buddy?" Because. <laughs> I I mean I knew about I I, I remember uh, hearing about this twenty years ago. It's mm. it's a shame that uh, it's it's one of these things that uh, you know doesn't get the traction maybe it deserves. Thank well, you so much. It's oh. and it's not surprising. Like I did I did no. this after this whole thing came up. I did this with my third year students uh, here in Oslo. And because we we were actually doing the reception of of Isaiah in the New Testament that day, and and so we we kind of talked through some stuff, asked what scenes they knew and stuff like that, and this thing came up, and I was like, um, well, let's just talk about that verse real quick, see what happens when we read this, and like they had literally no problem accepting this, like what was going on, they had no problem identifying how the words were being used, like everybody in the room is just like, yeah, okay, yeah. cool, let's talk about something more interesting, <laughs> like and this and they, they, most of these are Christians, they're like, uh, yeah, can we please talk about Jesus now? Like, <laughs> wow. Just, it was no big deal. Thank you so much. Just the dude's back. Um, mm. I don't know this word. It, I'm going to say is because I'm ish. 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 Yeah. Ish is present in the first attestation of the name Israel at Ebla. Manasseh's children are named Ephir, Dust, and Ishi. Salvation, the first appearance of such. A yet, what is this? Yesa? Yesha. Yesha. Name before the word Yesa. Yesha. I don't know. Is anyone want to make a jab here? First appearance of such a. Or is this Yesha another one of those? Before the, a Yesha name before the word Yesha. Oh. 
okay. I think is making is trying to make a connection here between Ish, as I see it, and uh, like the the derivations of Yasha. Is that what he's trying to do here? I I don't ask me. I have no okay. clue. <laughs> I'm, I'm not asking you, Derek. It's okay. I... <laughs> Matt looks like he's he's digging. I know the the name Israel. I, I think it's widely agreed that that this is El contends or may El contend or or something like that. So I don't know that the the proximity of that name to a word that may mean dust or something like that. I don't I don't think is significant. Yeah. But I if there is a discussion like that going on uh, within. Uh, study of uh, among Assyriologists, I am unaware of it, but that would not be a, a big surprise. Yeah, I, I know. I, I Again, this is like, I mean, I guess Josh, it would have been nice if Josh was here, but I think I, I just, I don't, I don't understand the question really. I don't yeah. understand what the first appearance of Yesha before Yesha. Mm -hmm. I, I don't understand what we're actually, what we're actually asking about. Um, like, what are they trying to get at? What are they implying? What are they trying to say? Is that pretty? Uh, yeah, because I mean, if the if the if the uh, cuneiform sign ish is used to spell ish ra el or something, that's not. Again, that's that's for me doesn't lead to anything else. Okay. Than just that the sound you needed to make. A word was used but um but I, I yeah i don't know i don't i don't really understand what the rest of the question's asking got it vesper what is the um um phallus in the holy sepulcher church anyone know what no that idea. is dan is all over some yeah. stuff dan, so i can't dan about the um, <laughs> um so i think that is um a religious, a, a stone artifact, uh, navel, something like that. Uh, and if you go into the, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, you have, uh, there's you know a big uh, kind of atrium and you've got a smaller building and in there you can go and see the place where, where Jesus was uh, supposed to have been buried. And then opposite it, there's a little, you go up some stairs and there's uh, a, a side of a cliff uh, and you can barely see it. There's a bunch of stuff that's been built around it. And so they just have some glass and some mirrors to allow you to see some of the stone from this cliff, which is supposed to be the crucifixion in, site. That's inside the church? You yeah. go up the stairs? Oh, I don't remember seeing that. So if you go through those oh. doors, you've got that big slab right in front of yeah. you and you go to the left and you come around and there's the, the building that's on the inside. But yeah. if, if if you go to the, um, instead of going oh, all the way to see, that central yeah. building, you go to the right, yeah. you go up some stairs, right. okay. you go across and you can kind of peek in and you can look through the glass and you mm. see the cliff and then you go down and then you go left to get back to the, um, the crypt area. A lot of people don't know if you go right, there's actually a better view of part of that cliff side. Um, mm. that people don't ever go to. So if you're in the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, when you come back down, go to the right instead of the left. Check it out. Um, and then and then behind on the other side of the, the little building that's on the inside, there's actually a really good example of some roughly first century CE um, rock cut tombs yeah, for true. ossuaries. But that, yeah. again, a lot of people don't go check that out. So that's... A really cool thing to see, but I I I would did not go inside the building when I was there, so um, the line was too long. So I don't know what it is. <laughs> David saying, if you go to his live stream, which is coming up, subscribe to his channel and drop a wizard emoji. So is that a wizard? I think it's hell. technically it a mage. A mage. Is it? Yeah, I was I was like trying to find, I was like searching wizard and it wasn't coming up. It was mage, and there's a female <laughs> mage there, I think. Yeah, do uh, a so witch, mage, who cares? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but then, Let him know you're from us. Derek, you are the wizard. You you, you, <laughs> you pull this together. I, I said this on uh, Marco Granado's stream. You Your content is 
uh, not only like a breath of fresh air for the, the community of biblical scholarship and religion and all that stuff, but it is like game changing. Like, I don't know anyone who produces such high quality content consistently every day, almost like it's just, it's just nuts. And like, we had you on, um, uh, deep drinks podcast and we called it the Derek knows everything Christmas special. Uh, <laughs> you, you asked for that name. I was like, come on, man, that's a bit arrogant. Of you. No, I didn't. No. You put that name on there and I'm like, I don't know. Dan is more than know everything yeah. or at least but, dabbles in everything. Doesn't know. Everything. Yeah. You know what I mean? um, so so the, the idea was like, you know, obviously Derek talks to so many people. It's like, uh, and so I'm just going to like throw things out in resurrection, empty tomb, you know, like I'm just going to throw what is your perspective after hearing so many academic perspectives and it's just amazing uh so uh yeah i just have to you know say great work on this channel thank you david thanks going to have to rewind but happy to see the power panel i thought they were going to say power rangers power panel happening (laughs) thank you so much mitch and it looks i forget who that uh, previous um super chat questioner was but somebody says it is the navel of the world and that kind of contextualizes things a little bit more i'm used to talking about the navel of the world as as a as a part of temple ideology that the temple is where um the earthly and the divine meet uh and so it's kind of the the navel of the world and so it wouldn't surprise me if some early christians conceptualized the place of of jesus's uh, burial and resurrection as the place where um, the divine and the human intersect. So I've not heard of it talked about that way. It would not surprise me if that is a very common way of thinking about that. that kind of like Jerusalem's the center of the cosmos to Jewish people or something like that, like in a way. Um, yeah. Analysis or Anna, what does it mean that Yahweh is only bound to the land of Israel? Is he able to roam past his boundaries? Okay, I'm not going to feel bad about jumping on this one because nope. <laughs> I've, I've written on this. Um, in pre-exilic period, uh, Adonai's sovereignty was limited to the land of Israel. Going outside the land of Israel was was leaving home court advantage. Uh, and we have in 2 Kings 3.27, the example where they're invading Moab to try to return Moab to um, vassalage and a... Human sacrifice catalyzes uh, a response from the Moabite deity Chemosh, which drives off the invading forces, and Adonai's prophecy uh, somewhat fails. So that is God going, uh, losing home court advantage. And you see this reflected in a number of different ways. You see Naaman comes down from Syria and is healed and wants to worship Adonai while he's back in Syria. But Adonai can only be worshipped on Israelite soil. So what does he do? He takes two cartloads of Israelite soil with him back to Syria. Uh, You have David is being pursued by Saul. And he's getting close to the borders of Israel. He's in the wilderness of Zin. And he tells Saul that your men are uh, forcing me to go worship other gods. The idea being once I'm outside of Israel, I can't worship Adonai. I've got to worship whatever deity is sovereign in that land. Uh, And then when you have the Babylonian exile, you have the Judahites outside of Israel unable to worship their God. And you have Daniel is represented as praying in the direction of Jerusalem. But uh, I published an article almost five years ago talking about Psalm 82 as the rhetorical universalization of Adonai, where you have the gods of the nations, the divine council are corrupt. And so God condemns them to mortality and the then the psalmist in the very last verse says, rise up, O God, uh, for you will inherit all nations. The idea being we have deposed the divine council, the gods of the nations who were sovereign in their various lands. And now you are going to take over all their rule and in essence, universalize Adonai's rule so that they can be accessed from any part of the world. And this would have served um the needs of people staying in Babylon, the needs of the rest of diaspora, um, Judaism or um, Judahite, the Judahite diaspora. So, yeah, I think there was definitely a a limit to Adonai's sovereignty in earlier periods that then gets uh, renegotiated, as I am wont to say, once we get out of the exile. Well said, Dan. Well said. And thank you, Anna, for that super chat. Good soul, how fluid is the Old Testament Hebrew text? Um, I assume, I mean, based on the 
I, I assume this is with regards to a versional plurality and um you know it's a it's a question that um um it's still one that that uh, uh, is constantly being negotiated by scholars. The the Dead Sea Scrolls kind of changed the the whole dynamic of of the way that scholars even approach or think about the biblical text. And I think we still have a ways to go. Um, so I'm you know depending on who you talk to, you'll end up with uh, with guys who who such as Emmanuel Tov or my my uh, my friend and and mentor Marty Abek, who will still come down pretty strongly on the side of a of a a, a fixed uh, stable uh, text in the second century, first century BCE. You got other scholars, you know, on the other side of this this question, such as uh, Gene Ulrich. I would put myself in that that same category that say, you know there's there's a lot of negotiation still taking place and i think one of the problems with with the way that we've approached the question up to this point is we're still grappling with what even constitutes a biblical text hmm. i don't know if anybody has anything else yeah well i think one we we can just throw in and remind people that that the the like when we talk about new testament stuff it we know about so many variants so much going on because there's mm -hmm. manuscripts pretty close to the production of the text and these kind of processes are happening and and one thing that's been in the media over the past couple of weeks is that Sotheby's is selling um, what they claim to be the oldest Hebrew codex uh, or Hebrew Bible codex and and in first of all it might not be um, there's like it's that's still up for debate um, but it's one of the three oldest anyway or one of the two oldest most likely um, and uh, and it's from like the year 900 between yeah I mean they say it's it's 800s but it's it's from around 900 between 900 and 950 something like that um, um, and that is literally like a thousand years later than the Dead Sea Scrolls fragments of these same books. And when we look at the Dead Sea Scrolls fragments, not compared with these later texts, but compared with each other, we see much more fluidity than we did before we had the Dead Sea Scrolls. And so it like scholars have used 75 years to get their heads around that you don't just have to say, oh, look, we matched a lot of words with the text from these Hebrew codices from the year 1000 or from 900, whatever, but that individually we see different sizes of, of the books, like not all the books are complete and all the manuscripts we have, the, the verses aren't always the same, the structure is not always the same, there's, different, there's differences on many different levels. So it's just like, we, we, we're still trying to hash out these arguments, uh, but, but the fluidity of it is like Kit says, even more in what the heck is the Bible at this time. Thank you so much for that. I got to do a plug here. We've got a, a father, a father who's got life to go deal with here. Dan McClellan. Um, I'm plugging you here. There we go. YouTube channel, go subscribe. I'm going to put it in the chat again for those who are watching right now. I hope that you will subscribe. Check out his uh, TikTok. Um, get a copy of his book. You said it's free, right? It is free, yeah. I have a link tree on all my social media where you can go straight to a PDF. And if you need a hardback or paperback, it is here. We're going to be covering uh, more in depth on his book here on Myth Vision. And uh, any final shameless plug? Uh <laughs> Because you're doing this, you're trying to do this full time now. So trying to do this full time, it's it's uh, it's going well. I'm I hoping that it continues to. But I appreciate everybody's support very much. This is something I never would have dreamed of being able to do six months, twelve months ago. Uh, and so I'm I'm living the dream in a lot of ways. Uh, and I just want to say I appreciate your time. I appreciate everybody's attention and your patience with me trying to to bogart all the. Uh, all the interesting discussions. Um, <laughs> and uh, I look forward to the discussion of uh, the panel on March 11th. I think that's going to be uh, a lot of fun. It will make for a lot of great discussion. And uh, I look forward to that very much.
Same here, Dan. Thank you. I won't keep you any longer. And uh, I look forward to us doing more in the future. Yeah, definitely. Thank Everybody you. have a good See night. You soon, Dan. See you as well. All right. Now we're down to the four horsemen, everybody. Um, <laughs> let's try to get through these super chats because I know Dr. Mott's up late over there. And yeah, you he... should probably stop taking the super chats at this point. Man. Yeah, you probably should. Yeah, I should. Let me just say stop super chats, all caps. Don't just send, me, just send don't money. Me your, no yeah. questions. Super yeah, stickers, yeah, yeah. but not chats. Yeah, I'm cool with the super chat if it's not like a deep where we have to like really pick this thing apart. Okay. Um, I'm very thankful. Trust me. I just don't want to leave people hanging. Uh, our limit on PhDs is dwindling, right? So do you want my little yeah. bloviating nonsensical answer or <laughs> um, <laughs> do you think the constant meditation on the permutations of thought the Bible has inspired has had an effect on the mind of man? Is it a poetic uh, metaphorical psychology book meant to teach man principles of judgment, reason? No. <laughs> so, okay. so, so, no, but so, so this is so, no, but yeah. So I, I, I mean, I've thought a bit about this kind of thing, right? Because this was like one of the steps in my journey away from being, you know, a conservative Christian to being not that. Um, but that, like, along the way, there's these kind of things, like, what the value? What's the value? You know, where do you find the value? Is the value in in the text being true? And therefore you're saved by faith and all that kind of stuff. And then you don't really think there's a hell to be saved from. So, okay, what do you do now? It's not so literally true. So you find other ways it's true and you find then you move through allegory and you move through spirituality and then psychology. And like you think, okay, this thing has to be really valuable in some way, but then you get like to that kind of statement where it's this amazing thing that if you meditate on it, then it will change the mind. I don't think so. Like, I, I think that um, actually, if you meditate on these things and you actually read what's there, it causes a lot more damage than good in a lot of cases. And there's, mm -hmm. there's a lot of danger there thinking that this is only going to lead to good because there's some kind of inherent value that's beyond what these things are saying. So if you pick out the good stuff, meditating on good stuff is a good thing. Bad stuff, meditating on bad stuff is a very bad thing. Um, and, and so you could say that about pretty much anything. Like yeah. I, I, I always encourage, uh, students to, to read the Lord of the Rings and, and cherry pick things and make a sermon out of, out of that in the same way, <laughs> just to see if they're able to do that. And, and you can, I mean, it's, you know, there's lots of good uh, stuff out there, but I, I, I think giving the, giving the Bible a status that, that it will when you meditate on it lead to the development of the mind or man or something. I think that's just like, then, then you're saying something good about meditation, but not so much the, the Bible. Thank you. And thank you for yeah. the question, Dr. Jordan B. Peterson. So, right. <laughs> yeah. Theo <laughs> Jansen. Thank you for the uh, 666. Paul's letters are the earliest. I think does Philippians one demand a church hierarchy before the gospels were written? Philippians one. Uh, it's, it's been a, it's that's you, Kip, it's isn't it? it? Smells like it you. <laughs> really? <laughs> uh, I don't want it to be me. It's. Um, I mean, I have the, to actually pull out my New Testament. Do you, Do you remember how to spell Philippians? I uh, I don't even have to. I can abbreviate. Yeah. No, but so uh, I'm going to just go ahead and throw that out. That's not my field. So I, I'd love it if <laughs> Dr. Bird was here and, and could know, answer that. Right? But, um, I yeah. know. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. For those but who are I, tuning in, she had, to, not, she had to go. I'm afraid you're not going to get a satisfying answer from from the dregs yeah. that are left here. Uh, yeah. So and I mean, I we can confirm that, that. that, that the Paul's letters are generally assumed to be earlier than the Gospels. Yeah and stuff like that so whatever you find there would probably be would be something that that predates the formula formulation of the gospels and, and whatnot yeah um and it's pretty pretty common i think that to assume that that there were hierarchies and there were um, structures in place among yeah. christians prior to the writing and formulation of the gospels that it's rather the opposite that that through those institutional or maybe not institutional but at least organized communities that the gospels actually do become become formed so it's it's not a 
Um, it's not like people were reading the gospel in a book and saying, oh, let's make a house church. But it was rather, yeah. uh, you know, it happened in a different way. Yeah, I was going to say I'd want to know what, what is meant by hierarchy, but, you know, you know, it's all good. It's all good. Um, just a quick hello, good friends, Derek and Kip, looking forward to the debate on myth vision in March. So, Hanny, thank you for the super chat. Uh, critical faculty, please subscribe. Uh, Hanny's going to be debating a Muslim on uh, mm. science in the Quran. Like, are there are there scientific miracles within the Quran? Uh, and of course, the Muslim guy says yes, and Hanny says no. And uh, they're going to be debating on Myth Vision in March, so be on the lookout. I'll be setting up the stream so that, you know you can get notified. Thank mm. you so much, Hanny. I hope people go and subscribe to your channel. You're doing great work on the science side, and a lot of people need to check that out. Mr. Monster says, if God is omnipresent in everywhere all times, wouldn't that mean he is also in heaven and in hell at the same time? I would say if he's I would omnipresent. so. I, you know... I mean, sure. sure. Um, I, I, but, I can give which you God? Answer. Yeah. I, I was going to say, I'm the president pre preacher gave to me, which was, I'm not going to answer such a ridiculous question. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, I mean, this, but this, so this, again, this is one of those questions that, uh, so I'm not sure where Mr. Monster is um, in, in their, um, <clears throat> thinking about other things, but yeah, you know, I do get this question occasionally from students. They come and say, "Well, how can God both be omnipresent and compassionate, or something like that?" You know, because because exactly this thing that if God is there in hell or or there and with starving children or cancer wards or or whatever, and sees all of these things, then how could God also like claim to care? And and that's kind of one of those one of those challenges that you often hear, kind of people that are just kind of starting to tweak out those inconsistencies in their th in the theology. Mm -hmm. This just this this just reminds me of of one of my favorite Simpsons episodes when Homer ends up being a missionary in a, <laughs> in a Polynesian island and or or a South Pacific <clears throat> island and and one of and and he also introduces gambling. And blackjack at the same time and one of my favorite lines in that whole episode is this poor this poor guy going what kind of a god would make an ace worth one and eleven <laughs> <laughs> so sorry so just... good thank you so much for that shadman says was the angel of the lord concept in the old testament as a whole a fabrication what was the Deuteron deuteronomistic authors thinking of j and e's anthropomorphism um, so, so, well, I mean, obviously it was a fabrication because we don't believe that angels were walking around on behalf of God. So, so from, from our perspective, yes, it's a fabrication, but I think that's the, the, I think the question probably goes more to the, the thing of were the angels placed into the text in order to clean the text up theologically in a time when you couldn't actually paint a picture of of god walking around talking to people um on earth anymore because uh, like you know that there's this development in theology or that's we assume that there's this development in theology from kind of god can walk around and interact with people and hey how you doing and it's fine and we have some of these stories where, where god obviously is is there meeting people face to face but then uh, later theology develops in a way that God is too holy. Um, you couldn't, you can, can't get to God. You shouldn't be in the Holy of Holies. It's just that one priest once a year can go in there and they tie something to his foot to pull him out in case he dies because he accidentally saw God or whatever. And so you have this, like this fear of seeing God because he's so holy. And then you can't then have stories that just say, then Abraham was just chilling on his patio with, with God and so then it says, well, it was some some dudes or some angels, and and then we get this the angel of the Lord, and and then Yahweh or God sometimes get interchanged in some of these stories because maybe maybe there's some redactional fatigue or something happens and people mm. they kind of it's not smoothed over, um, and so that that's one of the kind of the that's the main lines of this idea that these angels are secondary to the texts and they're not the 
the primary story wasn't originally to tell a story about the angel of the Lord doing something, but it was more that the Lord did something. And then they just threw in the, 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 mele, uh, the uh, Malach uh, part, the angel part, just to kind Malach. of, yeah, Malach, uh-huh. uh, to, to smooth it over theologically. Thank you so much for that. Melody Joyce has great panel Thanks, discussion Melody. today. Congrats, David. Yep. Much. I mean, this has been like this. Someone sort of said before that um, that I love that Deep Drinks is getting all these subscribers from this conversation in reference to God's junk. So it's just like a whole. Like, <laughs> and someone said, put it on, put it on your team. So I'm like, David became popular after discussing God's dick on stream for. <laughs> Dangling <laughs> David. So That's what I'm going to Are you new to the internet, David? <laughs> <laughs> Dangling David. Doc Pleromanot, I demand a oh, no. refund. You are oh. all now dead to me. I'll bite to the FMG. Thank Sorry, you. Doc. Yeah. Yeah, well, Doc. We appreciate to... you anyway. Go to David's YouTube. We're going to check that here soon. If you haven't subscribed, it is pinned in the chat right now. And if you're watching this later and it's not live, go in the description. It is there. David, be sure when we're done with the live to drop a comment so I can pin it up at the top. Uh, Cheryl's back. Thank you again. I recently got my PhD from a conservative academic institution. I should have sent my money to Myth Vision. I'm learning more from these scholars' platforms than I ever did in the conservative oh. university. Wow. I mean, that's very nice, Cheryl. I'm sorry that yeah. that, uh, <laughs> that you feel like uh, like your your money was was poorly spent um, on your education, but I. Yeah, I, know, I, I, it just so one of these. It's it's one of these things um, that I, I get frustrated by. I, I, I think in large part because I saw it um, playing out in real time in my own academic journey. Um, there's such a within within academics. Um, I think you know there's there's such a there's such a focus for I don't know if this is the case everywhere but certainly for some institutions to produce um results to produce scholars to produce graduates um that you know oftentimes and I'm not saying this is this is at all uh your situation uh Cheryl but it it just it brought to mind um situations that I've seen where um, you know, students uh, were lied to regularly about the the potential value of their credentials upon uh, upon completion of their degree program, or hmm. you know, st- institutions would encourage you just to keep making those tuition payments. Um, you know, even if you're just kind of barely scraping by, uh, it just yeah it's it's uh, yeah there's there's a lot of tragic stories thank you um, i feel the same way i went to a conservative christian college and i remember at the time it wasn't channels like this that i was i was reading commentaries from reformers and i learned more from the protestant reformer commentaries than i was at the christian institution i was at so uh it was i mean the only thing i learned from there was like organizing theological terms and like little tiny things that weren't really it's almost like you could have looked up in a dictionary and found out angelology demonology and like get the meaning of what these things are but other than that man it was very conservative so sentinel apologetics in the house rob says kip stop beating a dead horse on esslinger's babble just happy to see you spending your money on derek's channel (laughs) <laughs> thank Good. you rob appreciate Keep you giving them your money rob thank you thank you scott milligan i hope it you don't do reverse psychology and cause them to not super chat us here oh, i really do sorry man no, I, no 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 i understand, I understand. uh scott milligan thank you just joined so i don't know if this has been asked but what's the current scholarly consensus on when israel went from henotheism to monotheism see i don't know that they're i i don't think we're they're as far as I know, I don't think we're close to a consensus on on this particular question. Only that it's something that happened, and it it happened uh, gradually, and and that uh, the the Babylonian destruction of Jerusalem had a lot to do with it. I don't know. Hmm. Yeah, I, th- I mean, I think 
it, there's, there's a, I mean, there's pretty wide agreement that that the latest texts of the Hebrew Bible are are monotheistic, and the problem isn't accepting that, like you know, second or third Isaiah or or some of the later texts are pointing to monotheistic tendencies. But there's two issues that we we haven't resolved that relate to that. One is the dating of those texts, mm-hmm. and and when we can actually like place them actually historically. And then the other problem is the the fact that that this change to monotheism is most likely purely among the literary elite um, and and connected to a very few people who could use, were surrounding these texts and that what we see um, in actual um, people on the ground and the way they were worshiping doesn't seem to actually take effect until fairly long after uh, the texts are written. And so there's kind of that, when, when do you say something has happened? Does it happen when somebody writes down something and says it happened? Or do you do it when actually people accept it broadly? And to say, yeah, so I think, I mean, a lot, yeah, there's a lot happening in the late Second Temple period, but we don't know exactly when these things really become valid. Thank you. Thank you. Discovering ancient history with Pat Lowinger. What constitutes a variant text is problematic. Agreed. Yep. Especially with Deuteronomy 32, 43 and issues that, uh, you know, are are right there in the whole, uh, is it sons of Israel, sons of God? Like, uh, sounds like the divine council, they're trying to erase it from the, Masoretic, and I think I mean this is this is what what uh, what Pat is getting at is actually applicable to this to this point in large part because um, you will see uh, and we really need to to move on but uh, you one of the issues at play here is that you will see different types of texts in antiquity doing different types of things even though they're using the same the same raw material, the same text, which is one of the reasons you see the kind of development you do happening in the book of Deuteronomy that you do uh, as late as, you know, the first century BCE. Thank you so much. Appreciate that. Uh, We just have a few more here, making sure I didn't miss anything. Pat, thank you for that super chat. Um, And then we're going to be checking, we're going to be checking David's channel here in a minute. David, what time is it in Australia where you're at? It is eight fifty five AM. Wow. Um and yeah. You were up early to do this. So <laughs> I was. Grace one seventy what time it is. <laughs> it's like early in the morning now there, isn't it? It's almost midnight, yeah. Okay. Uh did Ezekiel actually believe the world of the Lord the word world? The world the of word. the Lord came to him and uh write down what he really thought. I think was it's being... supposed to be the word of the Lord. Right. Yeah. So did Ezekiel actually believe the word of the Lord came to him and write down what he really thought was being revealed to him? I think that's possible. But so we don't, I mean, we don't. It's definitely possible. But but isn't it also a, a literary or a genre kind of thing that a prophet would have his story about how the, the word of the Lord came to them? And and so there's like, I mean, it. I, I don't have a problem with thinking that that the prophets thought they were speaking on behalf of God. So that's not a that's not an issue for me. But but the, there's also literary typing where where you would just you would you, you would need to have that kind of a call story or a, or an inspiration story, revelation story. And yeah. So it's uh, yeah. yeah. It becomes a trope in many respects. And it shouldn't be surprising either, because I mean, this is this this is something that that happens within uh, within uh, Christianity today, especially among uh, sects where you're strongly encouraged to continue to tell your own story of conversion. Yep. Thank you so much. That's that's the wrestle I have with certain material in the New Testament. Is this literary? Does this have memory? Uh, there's so many issues. Grades 174, how intense is your anti-supernatural bias? Pretty intense. 
Yeah, <laughs> about about as intense as the angel that smacked me after I said yeah. that. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Like it's funny how that like gets thrown around at um, at us online for being skeptical. I was just opening something here for a second. All right, thank you, Gray's one seventy four. I would say I definitely don't live thinking there's the supernatural, um, and mm. I don't even like you know I'm not even like thinking, hey maybe there maybe there's something here. I don't think that way. Could there be? Uh, I guess I don't know. You know, I, I believe to, in. But, I believe in the supernatural the same way I believe in like goblins or like, you know, fairies. Like I just, it's the same category. Right. Like to me, it could be there, but like, you'll have to show me some evidence for it. Exactly. And I'm not like thinking there is, I don't go to bed at night thinking there is. Uh, Rob's back. Thank you again, Ooh. Sentinel. Wow. Kip, would you say Peter Flint was an unbiased liar? Un Hold on. Bias. Sorry. Are we actually, unbiased. Are we like, like, sorry. I misread that. Do you does, want to answer? Does he actually expect me to answer this this garbage? I I'm you know I this is this is a this is a guy that I I knew was a good friend and a mentor of mine. Really, you really think I would talk to my friends that way? Like just I you, this is disgusting. Yeah, I'm just gonna so say that. This like for background. This is like. So this this is an, this is a really below the belt kind of thing to to throw out there. Um, so so Peter Flint passed away a few years ago um, and was was a very important person in our field in the of Dead Sea Scrolls. Um, has influenced a lot of people. He's he was a very very kind person, a very very um, helpful person for a lot of people in the field, and he. Um, he also was was very conservative and and tended to interpret things uh, in a way that that was was more um, more conservative than than where a number of us are today, and and he used some of his um, some of his platforms to kind of talk about the consistency of scripture and things like that in ways that we wouldn't uh, we wouldn't support, but um, but throwing around that kind of um, a kind of name calling and forcing that on to, to Kip who um, actually had a personal uh, mentorship with, with Peter is, is really just nasty. No, no, it's just not worth it. Like, so, but Peter Flint did, made a lot of great contributions and like all of us, he also did some things that, that other people don't agree with. And that's doesn't mean that we would talk poorly about him. I appreciate you uh, addressing that and, and standing up as well. We, you know, I have disagreements with scholars I have on all the time, and I might say maybe there's a bias on their side that causes them to draw conclusions. I wouldn't read into their motivation as if they're liars. Uh, I would say they were. I just had a wonderful conversation. I recorded with Delcy Allison Jr. for about an hour and a half. And wow. there are moments where Del, like, he, man, I love interacting with the guy. At the end of the day, he has his conclusions. And um, I have mine, right? And I'm like, uh, we started wrestling at, in Paul's Corinthian Creed. At that point, I'm like, well, is this, could this have a legendary trope to it? Even the creed itself. And he goes, I don't see it. And then I, I brought another scholarship and stuff. Um, he, he's like, I guess there could be something. I just don't see it. But um, you might find that I'm biased and I have certain conclusions. And I just hope that uh, when I'm gone, other content creators who may have been affiliated with me or friends with me don't think that way, you know, of me. But uh, I hope uh, I hope that uh, everybody had a wonderful time with this stream. I'm going to switch up the mood here. We're going to go ahead and start talking about David's uh, YouTube videos and channel and and what we have coming oh, up. David, I, yeah, tell me what's before up. We, before we before we up, um, load it, um, first of all, um, fuck you, Sentinel Apologetics. <laughs> your, your question wasn't tough. It was leading. Uh, and secondly... Uh, let's jump into the fun stuff. But I just want to say um, that uh, I want to do a thank you stream to everyone who is coming over because I've been spending all this time like commenting in the uh, the chat, just like thank you, thank you, thank you to everyone. And I'm just mm -hmm. like, you know what? I'm doing a charity stream. I've got to have 
Uh, if you if you want to come on and chat, I'd love to do it. I'm I'm doing a charity stream when we get to a thousand subscribers, and it'll be like twelve hours or six hours or something. So, yeah, come along and we'll have a chat and talk about some deep stuff. Um, but secondly. We do have a um, podcast coming up in 11 hours, and we're talking to Miss Lemon about uh, conspiracies and a rising cult in South Korea. She's in South Korea, and it was affected by uh, but this cult affected the COVID-19 stuff pretty pretty hugely over there. So, um, so that we'll be talking about that. But I do want to mention, just touch on the panel. The panel, like, it really is going to be, um, I'm hoping it's going to be the death punch to this topic. It won't be, um, but that's what I'm going to be aiming to do because right. obviously people will find excuses to do everything. But we'll, I, I'm compiling all the apologetics in the best faith interpretation that I can, and I'll be giving it to the panelists, and the panelists will be directing the apologetics given by Jordan Peterson, Frank Turek, William Lane Craig, gotquestions.com, Mike Winger, John McRae, Alan Parr, Paul Copen, Douglas Wilson. I spent $40 on this book, which was very expensive for... I went to the local Christian bookstore. Um, <laughs> Douglas Wilson and Answers in Genesis. I We are going to be... They're going to be discussing all those points. So if, any, if anyone knows these people, please tweet out the link to this video because I want them to know that these Bible scholars are coming. Excellent, excellent, excellent. Okay, I... Let me see. I am going to be refreshing in just a moment the YouTube channel. Oh, I already did when I hit back. Dang it. I meant to keep that page not refreshed. <laughs> I was going to do like, where are we at on sub count here? And uh, I wanted well, to be as shocked. So, okay, before we do that, I'm giving everybody a last final, last final. I do this every time. If you don't know me by now. I'm giving everybody the next 15 seconds, okay, to subscribe to Deep Drinks. It's pinned in the comment section, chat, and then we're going to hit refresh. 15 starting now. 15, 14, Oof. 13, 12, 11, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, <laughs> 4. Three, two, one. one. All right. I'm just letting everybody know live. We need to refresh this thing. And here we go. Sharing the screen. Hey. Wow. Whoa. Nice. That is a huge, that is a huge boost. <laughs> you got like, Thank you, I don't everyone. know. How many did you get? And there's still people coming uh, in. Yeah, there's still people coming in. Hang on. Let me just. Yeah, I can see it's the like numbers going up in like real time. 160? Yeah, something like that. that. About that? Just That's getting to a thousand nice. will give us the ability oh. to super chat. And I'm, exp I'm, I'm yeah. my background's in marketing. I'm promoting the, sh I'm spending all of my free time holding a baby in one arm and trying to promote this channel. Is uh, not this channel, this panel as much as possible. So wow. having super chats will make questions so much easier because, like, I'm keeping, I'm trying to keep up with just saying thank you to people, and it's hard. So um yeah so thank you everyone who's subscribing really appreciate it i can see the numbers still going up it's 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 really great and of course i this this ch the channel deep drinks um it is nothing without the amazing panelists and the guests that have decided to, that have uh, agreed to come on and i can't thank them enough so make sure all their uh, channels will be linked in the panel um and make sure and then you can subscribe to them as well here so do that but um yeah wow that's I'm huge i'm super glad that we like, can help I'm, you I'm, yeah, but I don't get so why much. you have a Miller Lite in the background of your banner there. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, which one? Which one? A Miller oh. Lite. <laughs> where? 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 The, you know, oh, the so this is, oh, okay. Was it yeah, course? So I, I, okay, oh. so I, I have to. I probably should have explained it. A, is it a Foster's? No, I don't know why. No, I don't know why I had to explain this. So the guest chooses the drink, and then the oh. drink sets the tone of the interview. Are we so, drinking? Are we going to drink? So. Yeah, it's, well, I'm on, sure it's a, uh, we can, it's but, but with, light, the, with the panels because there's so many people. But you can see I've had I've got had guests choose. Um, you know, I've I've drunk vodka with guests at, at seven a.m. and then Derek and I <laughs> drank coffee at one a.m. So for me, my time. So I mean, it's it's a wild ride. Um, I had Shannon Q on, and we got um, Shannon drinks rum, uh, and we drank a lot of rum. And by the end, I was trying to find the the end stream button. It was pretty. Um, it was a fun one. Uh, so yeah, this, it's a variety. Sometimes we do sober streams, sometimes not sober streams, but um, the drink sets the tone of the conversation and the guest chooses the drink. 
Well, um, if if Doctor Moat or I win the uh, the Morris Seebeck uh, bottle of whiskey, maybe we'll uh, have to crack <laughs> that open for. <laughs> Do you know what's uh, funny? I will I will say this. Um, so Michael Jones has been on twice, and he's always like Scotch. We drink Scotch. So I have the Christian apologist coming on. He's like, we drink Scotch. I have a Satanist who's been wanting to come on for ages, and um, he's the head brother of the Noosa Temple Satanic Church. And um, he's like, we drink tea, and I'm going to bake the best <laughs> poppy seed scones you've ever had in your life. Uh, best pumpkin scones. So the Satanist, it's tea and pumpkin scones, and the Christian apologist, it's straight whiskey. So it's wow. I, I just love the dichotomy that this show is created. Yeah, it's, and I only wild drink, wild. you know, I'm Amazing. into the coffee, so I'm not doing <laughs> yeah. all that. Hey, I do want to do a plug here for our, our friend Dan. Um, I did. I, it was notified to me. One of mm. our commenters brought it up, and I've been notified before, and I just it slipped my mind. Dan is doing a course tonight on Satan and the Bible from seven to eight thirty p.m. Mountain Standard Time, and the link I just posted it in the chat. Uh, it's right here for anybody who wants to sign up. You can donate whatever and participate in terms of uh watching it so i am all about that plug you know me i want to give people shout outs and dan's trying to do this full time so if you appreciate what dan mcclellan's doing and you want to have him on myth vision more you want to see him on his channel more to keep going full time whatever you can afford is what it is uh what his uh platform is is allowing so you could donate one five ten and you know people are really good people who support the community always show love so if you can't afford much, this is the opportunity to be able to go and sign up for one of the classes. We'll discuss the nature and origin of the figures of Satan and other fallen angels within the Hebrew Bible, Second Temple Jewish literature, and New Testament. There will be a one-hour presentation over Zoom, followed by a 30-minute Q&A. Everyone who registers will also receive a link on the 24th to download a recording of the class. Minimum donation of $1 to register for more information and to register. There's the site. So go show Dan some love. I I'd I'll love to that. have, yeah, I'd love to see people go, yeah. wow, since you plugged that Myth Vision, here I am from Myth Vision. Let Dan know you came from Myth Vision so we can have him back on the channel more. Send a mage, a mage emoji. <laughs> yeah, mage emoji, he'll know. Um, let's refresh again. I bet you people have trickled in since since we, and then I'll, 796, we're almost at 800. Damn. So thank yeah. you guys so much. I really, I'm, I'm overwhelmed. I, I'm actually a little bit emotional about this, but I'm overwhelmed with everyone's kindness. And um, if you don't cry, I don't believe you. So <laughs> I'm just, uh... I'm, uh, I might cry, but I'll be off stream. <laughs> <laughs> um, Dr. Matthew Munger, when are we going to be able to plug something of yours? How can we, you know, really put you out there? Are you going to be writing something at some point or doing a YouTube channel one day or? I don't know, man. Uh, so I've got, I mean, I've got about um, seven or eight articles in the pipeline, different places that are different you know, stages of publication. I'm working on a couple of scholarly books, editing a Dead Sea Scrolls thing for this project that Kip and I have been a part of in, in Norway. Um, I've, you know, I've got, a, I've got a ton of scholarly stuff going, but I haven't, haven't really shifted towards the public um, outreach kind of stuff that much, but you know, the more I spend time with these guys, the more I want to do it. So uh, you never know. Um, I've got got a couple ideas floating around, but I don't want to overcommit by saying something live on on the internet. <laughs> <laughs> well, aren't you aren't you tempted by all the drama that you see floating around at the moment? Oh yeah, <laughs> I mean, I tell so you good. what, I, I it. It it makes me it makes me very happy to be able to hide in my office and write articles that seven people will read when I see all the stuff that goes on on Twitter. And it's, uh, yeah, this is why Marty Apec doesn't do interviews, right? Yeah, I don't exactly. blame him. I'm late. Suppose the Shadim are there. Thank you, what? Constellation. I really appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, um, maybe maybe we'll do a follow up interview with you, Matt. Uh, however, yeah. we want to do this. Um, I'd love to do a course with you. Uh, figure out a way to get you over here in America and and uh, yeah. do some stuff together, man. That would be yeah. wonderful. Sounds good. Absolutely. So before I let you go, Kip, Kip, tell us about yours, uh, your channel again, and uh, Kip you Davis doing? on YouTube. Uh, more Dead Sea Scrolls content coming up soon. Um. And uh, yeah, 
support the Patreon if you can. I'm not a very I'm not very good at at the Patreon thing. We did a uh, we did our first with with my tier one uh, donors. We did our first um, um, private uh, private live session, which was a lot of fun. So I'm we're going to be doing those once every month or six weeks or or whatever. Um, so yeah, come and uh, come and support my work because when you do that, then I can I can I can do more of this. Hey, well, um, you need to add the links to your Patreon in your video descriptions because see, I, I don't know what the fuck I'm doing. So yeah, you really I don't. Like <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you. Were, I gotta help you out. Plus, you could have it okay. right here. Um, I don't know if you can see my mouse or not. Oh, yeah, but really? like it'll show up right here, oh, wow. and people can click it, and they can find your supports and somebody other social please, media. Please help me. So <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. If we Derek can't, I can help you, Kip. I do. I yeah. I've I've tried oh, wow. to look for like so much information on you, and it's like a nightmare to, to go through like all the like, <laughs> like fan pages that's, and like. That's good and I'm like, well, is this real or is this not? Like, yeah. It's, uh, <laughs> Yeah, my, my OnlyFans page, oh, yeah. that, that oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. that's a heck of a spot. Um, yes, I do recommend Dr. Collins' book on the Dead Sea Scrolls, um, 100%. And he has an audible, short, little, fun, three, four-hour audible book on the Dead Sea Scrolls that John Collins um, wrote, and it's out there too. So if you're just someone who needs to drive and listen to something, go use one of your audible credits and go do that. Deep Drinks, 800, getting 800. close. Woo! Oh, thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. Snap, 800. Like yeah, and you know there's going to be another 50 to 100 uh, over the next day or so. Um, so we need help. If you're out there and you're sharing this, share the content, get it subscribers, get him get him to 1,000 so we can start monetizing his channel. He deserves it. He's been working hard. So thank All you. Right. I don't want Matt hating me. Matt, Matt, you're going to hate me forever. And I don't think there's any sacrifice that could possibly justify uh, or atone for leaving you, keeping you up this late. So I'm going to let you say your final words and then David, say your final words. And then I'll do my little uh, matrix intro. Uh, no, thanks. Uh, thanks for doing this guys. I just, I, I mean, I, I've, I've said this to Derek, I think privately, but I'll say it again that, that like, I, I mean, I did my PhD here in Norway, and I was focused on on Hebrew Bible, pseudepigrapha, you know, languages, all that kind of stuff. But but when I discovered myth vision, like that's where my I got the breadth of scholarship that got me reading stuff that I that I hadn't even been exposed to wow. um, through all of my years of studying. So it's like I I mean I it, like the European PhD, you just kind of go. Whoosh, straight into something and and you don't get that breadth but like the scholars you have on i've read so many of their books now and learned so much and and so like i i really really can't like emphasize enough how how good the work you do is and how important it is to make this stuff available because even people that are specialists in their field can use this as a resource to get new ideas, get stuff that's going on and you get people pretty quickly once they publish something exciting. So I, I, I just like, and I'm, I'm glad that you're doing what you're doing. Wow. So, and I hope people out there keep supporting the people that are doing this um, and support Kip because he's, 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 he's the only person I like. <laughs> outside my family <laughs> I, I don't, oh i love that there's not many <laughs> so. kip, kip, i have one question before i give it to you david yeah. um my question is kip are you trying to do this full time is this i would goal? like to it's a goal it definitely is Okay. Um, it, so I had a, uh, and I, maybe I should let people know. So I, I, I had a plan, uh, to get there, um, within like the next, next year and a half, two years kind of thing. Um, so circumstances have me in a position where I'm, I'm wondering if I need to accelerate that. Um, so, uh, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it, it's something that, that, that is in the works and I'm still, I'm still, yeah, I'm working towards that. Okay. Well, I think someone mentioned before that Kip does 11 live streams a day. Um, and I'm like, yeah, you've got to, 
But surely, with, with the amount of live streams I'm seeing you on at the moment, like surely you'll, you'll be very close to being able to do this full time. Hopefully, if people go and support your channel. Hopefully. Constellation, thank you, thank you for that. You didn't have to. Big news in the ex Jehovah's Witness community: a governing body member is not there anymore. That's a big deal. That's like saying one of the cardinals or the, next to the Pope are, or even oh, wow. you know, has left the Catholic mm -hmm. Church or something. So I don't know what the reason is, but uh, curious to know. Constellation, thank you for that support. And uh, David, your channel man, we're gonna keep growing. Um, I am plugging. For, for the sake of my friend, uh, Derek Bennett, who just dropped a new video for those who are watching, 237 people, putting Falk in his place on the resurrection of Osiris. So you may want to go check that video out. You may, if you want to, um, you know, he was editing this last night. I didn't know this, but um, he like pretty much tells, and you're going to see it at the beginning of this video, tells Derek in his response video, which I never watched the whole thing, to go hang himself just like Judas. I don't know if you all knew that. Like Whoa. he literally tells him, and mind you, if he knew a little bit about Derek, Derek comes from mental health, you know, background like me with drug addiction and knows what it means to struggle. So I don't know if you'd be saying those kind of words to somebody if you really knew, you know, the kind of stuff they've been through. So in this video, you actually see it right out the gate. Um, but he also critiques this uh, PhD in his own field. And I would say took him to task. So David, Oh, well, I was just going to say, I've just subscribed to that channel um, just recently, actually. Um, I saw him do a, a piece on Michael Jones, and I was like, and, and we had some back and forth. It was, um, I, but I've become a fan. But um, one thing I did want to um, just, just touch on with the panel, the reason why I think this is so important is because the people that believe these stories to be historically accurate, they're, they're, defending, they're defending things that are abhorrent, like disgusting. Um, slavery is not something to be laughed at. It wasn't like going to work. You know, these are the ownership of other human beings as property. You know, th this is, this, uh, this strips away, um, people's dignity. Uh, you know, beliefs inform people's actions, belief, not to get too dark, but beliefs fly planes into buildings and blow up abortion clinics and treat other people, um, well, like slaves. I think it's important that if you are going to have a belief um, as brutal as we can own other people as property, you should have the historical, um, back, you should know the historical background in which it was written. You should investigate whether or not it is something that um, you can find um, valid in your worldview um, before you even start to look at the morality of it. Um, you should have the facts right. So for me, it's a very important issue because with the, the podcast being going more into human rights and for me it's it's more about uh, you know the podcast and and everything that we do is more more and more of finding about humanity uh and making sure that um, people have good reasons to believe the things that they believe um so this is oh i can see all the uh, mage emojis <laughs> thanks guys yes <laughs> but um but yeah so for me this is a very important um uh, conversation and I, i'm doing everything I can to, if you know any apologists that I didn't mention, anyone that you found convincing or you know someone who has found them convincing um, about slavery, we want to address um, their points. So please let us know. Yeah. Thank you so much, guys. I'm going to let you go. Um, and uh, never forget, we are, are Myth Vision. Vision. Son, do you want to know what the truth is? After this, there's no turning back. You take the blue pill and you wake up in your bed and believe whatever you want to. You take the red pill and you stay in Wonderland. And I show you just how deep the rabbit hole goes. Remember, all I'm offering is the truth, nothing more.